Well, good morning, everyone. Um, hopefully you can hear me okay. Uh, get a thumbs up from Alfred, Tyler, you're all good to go. Well, wonderful. Well, thanks for joining us today. Um, I will say we were supposed to have some lovely little background music in that slide deck, but of course, first technical glitch of the day, couldn't get it to work. And uh, last year, Diane Riding promised she would maybe hum a tune um, for the intro session. So if she's on yet, uh, you might just have to save that for the for the break at lunchtime. Um, so by way of introduction, I'm Carson Callum. For those of you that don't know me, I'm uh, MVP's general manager, and I, I welcome everybody to our 43rd annual general meeting. I know we'd be, we would prefer to be doing this in person, uh, but unfortunately the pandemic related restrictions and conditions just didn't allow for it this year again. So we wanna do our part to help keep people safe. And especially since a lot of people are busy uh, in, in calving season. Our aim is to do a in-person event this summer to try to bring people together for some knowledge transfer activities and, and, and networking and just a general you know, good time with less of the, the business side of things that our AGM usually, usually contains. And this will probably be done outdoors in a barbecue format. Um, so just stay tuned for those, those details when we get those announced. So this morning and over the lunch hour, uh, we're gonna have a couple industry knowledge sessions. Our first session is gonna be focused on business risk management programs and your operation. You know, as we've seen over the last number of years, droughts, floods, excess moisture, all those production related challenges can have a heavy toll on, on your operations. So there's a variety of BRM or those business risk management tools that can help mitigate some of those risks associated with these kind of factors that we're seeing um, becoming even more severe. Our first two speakers will talk about some of those options, and then there'll be an opportunity to ask them some questions. So we have more time on the agenda um, and for their presentations and questions following. I'm going to refer you to their bios uh, in the AGM program that would have been attached in, in your link that you received um, from the event by package uh, to Dropbox. So first up is Jared Monroe, who pre president and CEO of Manitoba Agriculture Services Corporation. After Jared finishes his presentation, we have a pre-recorded session from Steve Funk, Director of Ag Risk Management Resources from Myers Norse Penny, uh, and, and we will play that recording. And then there'll be some opportunity to ask both of them any questions that you might have um, from their presentations following that. So I'm gonna, I see Jared is up on the screen here and I'm going to ensure that he is promoted to co-host, unless you have been already, Jared. Should be able to unmute yourself at least now. I, I think I put in that ask and then I gotta find you on the list here. Okay, so I think I'm good there. Um, just need to enable me to uh, to share my screen is all. Yep. As long as I can find you on the list of participants, we're getting a big list here. Dave. Um, I don't know if you can, because you're the, the host, if you can make Jared a co-host to allow that, just because I am only a co-host at this point. Just have to go into Jared's. Okay, Jared, should be coming through to you. Okay, I think we're, I think we're good. How's that look? Good. All right. Good. Yeah. Well, great. Thanks, Carson, and uh, and good morning to everyone. I know uh, kind of a snowy, icy day in lots of parts of the province today, and uh, I noticed that producers this year are very careful not to complain about blowing snow or pushing snow around the yard. And everybody's, uh, I think, optimistic going into the spring, seeing a little bit of moisture to get us going, which is great. Um, I'd like to also introduce uh, David Van Dines. He's joining me today. He's our chief product officer. And so he'll be around to, to answer all of the, the really tough questions that you have. 
and uh, in order that there's lots of uh, lots of colleagues from MASC on the call today as well and uh, encourage you to reach out to them. So I know that uh, risk management isn't doesn't excite uh, everyone as much as it does me, but uh, what I'll try to do today is just really keep it light, uh, give you some high level overviews and hopefully just pique your interest a little bit and uh, hopefully give you a few things to think about for your own farm operation. So when we talk about business risk management, or at least when I'm talking about it today, I'll really be talking about um, a formal definition of business risk management. And what I'm referring to is the suite of programs uh, that are available through the Canadian Agricultural Partnership to help producers manage uh, business risks, which are largely beyond their control. And so uh, those include agri-insurance, agri-invest, agri-stability, agri-recovery, and the agri-risk program. And really the central purpose of these programs is to uh, reduce income losses that stem from production losses, severe market volatility, extreme events and disasters that are largely beyond producers capacity to manage on their own. And the reason that governments are involved in that is that often there's no private commercial product available to producers or it would be cost prohibitive and so government plays a role in that. And from the government perspective, it also provides uh, generally some stability in the programming that's offered year to year rather than, you know, having to deal to every emergency uh, in an ad hoc sort of way. So maybe if we take a, a little step back and talk about, well, what is risk in the first place? And so risk is really the chance of something happening that's going to impact the achievement of your objectives. Um, one of the definitions that I like is, is it's the uncertainty that matters. And the, the idea behind that is that uncertainty is infinite, but risk is limited. And so you really need to focus on those risks that are most relevant to your operation and sort of ignore those, those uncertainties that, uh, that are kind of out there. And so uh, I really like, um, I really like this, this quadrant here on the right to kind of explain the idea of of a risk management plan. And what planning um, for risk does is really helps us to avoid those extreme events. And so you can see on the table here, there's, there's four quadrants and there's lines that intersect each of those quadrants. And for everybody, for each individual, those lines are gonna be drawn in a different place depending on your risk appetite. And your risk appetite might be drawn uh, from you know, the diversity of your operation, perhaps uh, the amount of debt that you have, or perhaps even the stage you're at in your career. And so, um, you know, everybody's got a bit of a, a different risk tolerance. You'll notice, uh, you might've noticed on the previous screen that I highlighted a number of words in the definition that I, that I put up about business risk management. Um, some of those words were severe, extreme, uh, and disaster. And so these all imply that they're low probability events. Um, but another phrase that I underlined was beyond your capacity to manage, meaning that there's a really high business impact as a result of that event occurring. And so that kind of takes us over to this, this quadrant on the bottom right, which is risk transfer. And that's really what a lot of these business risk management tools are designed to do is to transfer the risk off of your farm and, and have somebody else also participate in it. And it's sort of a general, you know, in an insurance world, um, the general principle is that everybody pays a little bit so that, you know, if you do have that disaster situation, that there's a larger pool of, of money to draw on to help you through. So MASC's role in business risk management is really um, our, our, our mandate is to support Manitoba farmers by providing unique insurance, uh, targeted lending and access to agricultural services. And uh, although we'll talk a lot about insurance today, I do wanna note and highlight uh, some of the important lending programs that we have as well, particularly our stalker loan program. I just think that's a great tool for producers to, to purchase some, some uh, replacement heifers or some feeder livestock, uh, and largely you can use those animals as the security. And so managing your capital is, you know, again, uh, a bit of a risk management tool that's at your disposal. Um, in terms of insurance, uh, some of the unique insurance products that we offer include forage insurance, which is under the agri insurance program and livestock price insurance, which is funded through the agri risk um, program under the, the BRM suite. What I want to emphasize today, though, is really the importance of partnership. And 
Uh, I just think that a lot of the success that we've had in the past has been a result of the partnership that we've had uh, between MASC clients, MVP, and other producer organizations. And, uh, you know, I firmly think that will be key to our success going forward in all sorts of areas, including product development, service delivery, and communications. So on this slide, I just wanted to show you sort of um, kind of the, the state of the world over time, I guess, as it relates to forage insurance. Um, as many of you will probably know and probably experience in your own backyard, the, the number of forage acres has been decreasing over time. Uh, you can see in 2009, we were over 2 million acres and we're probably somewhere closer to about 1.4 million acres today um, based on Stats Canada's numbers. What we are seeing though in the dark green bars is that the acreage um, that's being insured has remained fairly consistent over that, uh, the, those 10 years or so. And so that's a really good sign. Uh, the yellow line here just shows the percentage of, of acres that are being insured in the province. And so, um, you know, I think often people will compare forage insurance to crop insurance and say, well, you know, we've only got 30% insured forages, but 90% insured annual crops. Um, you know, that's not very good. But I do want to I do want to say that this is actually pretty good. When you look across the, the country, Manitoba's actually got the third highest participation only behind Quebec and Prince Edward Island. And so, you know, I think we are doing some, some great things together to really enhance the forage insurance products. I want to point out a couple of um, points on this chart here where I think uh, partnerships have made a big difference. And so uh, back starting in about 2012, um, we worked very closely with Manitoba beef producers and, uh, and other organizations to really revamp the forage program as it is today. And you can see that, you know, when we launched that in 2014, we saw a really good bump in participation, which I think spoke to the value that was being provided. Uh, another key, uh, we, so we did have, you know, I think continued success, but we in sort of 2017 and 18 saw participation start to wane a little bit. And the next, I think, important point on this graph is really uh, when we started to, to do a forage insurance review, which started in 2020 and uh, involved, again, a concerted effort to work with producers and lots of consultation to uh, make some enhancements to the program and really to refocus our communications efforts. And I, I can't thank MVP enough and uh, directors enough for, for their work in promoting the program as well. Um, because at the end of the day, I think these are your programs. They're not MASC's programs. They're, they're really designed for you. And so they need to work for you. And, um, and so lots of success, I think, from having producers share their experience with other producers. So just a really high level um, forage insurance is part of the agri insurance program. The whole idea of agri insurance is to provide um, some protection against natural production losses from natural perils. Producers generally pay 40% of the, the cost. Um, premiums are, you know, a lot of people maybe don't understand premium. The, the most simple way to think about it is that it's really the, the actual losses over time. And so um, there's no markup, there's no administrative fees embedded into those premium rate. It is, it is the real losses. Um, so Canada and Manitoba pay for the balance of the premium costs as well as the administration costs. And uh, no surprise to you folks, either too little or too, uh, too much moisture is the leading cause of loss in our, in our 40, or pardon me, in our uh, close to 60 year history. So the forage insurance program, uh, there's a couple of two, it's really two options that you have. Uh, one is basic hay. So really think of it as a, you know, a cheap way to get some coverage on a whole farm basis of all of the hay that you produce. Uh, doesn't really matter what types they are. doesn't really matter the quality you get. It's really just the number of bales that you have to feed. Um, the select hay insurance is a little bit more tailored. Uh, coverage is offered specifically by crop type. Um, with uh, unique probable yields and unique dollar values for each of those types. And there's no offsetting between types. And that select pay is really the, you know, the crux of what came out of that, that new program that was launched back in 2014. 
There are a number of additional options and benefits that come with forage insurance. Uh, the first three on the list are options that you can add on. Um, so there's an enhanced quality option for select alfalfa growers. Uh, there's a harvest flood option for coarse hay growers. Uh, as well, there's a pasture insurance proxy program that's based on your, your forage insurance. That's an option as well. Um, and then there's two benefits that are sort of provided as part of your forage insurance. So one is forage restoration. So that's if your forage gets destroyed by excess moisture, we, we provide a benefit there to help you restore that forage, uh, as well as the hay disaster benefit, which I'll uh, talk a little bit more here on the next slide. So the hay disaster benefit um, has triggered, it started in 2014 with the new forage insurance suite. And the whole idea was really to try to replace um, some ag recovery programs that had occurred previous to that to cover off that additional cost of hay when there's a provincial wide uh, hay shortfall, as well as some of those additional transportation costs. Um, so it has triggered in three years since 2014. Uh, in 2018, paid over $3 million, 2019 was a little worse at $5 million, and in 2021, it's paid out an additional $8.4 million. Um, it's provided the, the costs of the program, the premium costs are all paid by government, and the whole idea of it is that it's really a catastrophic loss coverage. So the way it was designed, it was only supposed to trigger one in every 15 years, but we've, uh, we've seen it trigger three in the last uh, eight or so. Uh, currently provides an additional $44 a ton. Um, the trigger point is when more than 20% of our insured producers harvest less than half of their normal yield. Um, 2021 was obviously a, a bad year and that shows up in our numbers. Uh, almost 60% of our insured producers harvested less than half of their normal uh, hay. And, and that really allowed us to announce the program much earlier than in normal years. And so we were able to announce that back in July. So intended to cover some additional costs. Um, obviously this year, I think we would, it's fair to say that it's a bit short, um, but certainly I think does provide uh, some assistance. I wanted to give you a couple of case studies um, just to kind of give you some ideas of how select and basic hay work. Um, these are real examples. They're not intended to be representative of, of every producer, but I just wanted to give you some, some ideas of how, how it might work. So um, this, is a, this is a family on the Western side of the province. Um, after the launch of the new program in 2014, they decided that they would uh, sign up for forage insurance in 2015. They only insure select alfalfa, um, pure alfalfa. And, when they started out, they were growing about 250 acres a year. And over time, they've gotten their acreage up to about 950 acres. Um, so over the course of their time being insured, they've paid premiums of about 37,000. Um, that's ranged, I would say, from about $2,000 a year up to $10,000 a year as their acreage has grown. Um, but you can see sort of how, how the program has worked for them. Uh, the first year, three years they were insured, they didn't have a claim. Uh, but in 2018, basically the, you know, every year where there was a province-wide uh, hay shortfall, they were impacted. So it was, they're sort of bellwethers, I think, for sort of the bigger provincial uh, scene here in terms of hay production. So uh, over 2018, 19, and 2021, they, uh, you can see the amounts that they received in each of those years and correspondingly the hay disaster benefit. Uh, I think most importantly, just to kind of give you a sense in 2021, uh, between the hay disaster benefit and their normal forage insurance, they, they collected about $390 per acre that they insured. And so, you know, that gave them some tools to be able to purchase some alternative feed. In terms of basic hay, again, uh, this is the low cost, whole farm kind of approach, um, lower coverage, $94 a ton. This producer, I'm pretty sure, saw Tyler's video in the spring of uh, 2021 and thought, hey, this is a good idea. I need to get some insurance. So uh, he signed up, um, paid a premium of about $2,100, grows all types of hay, alfalfa, alfalfa grass and grass. And he also selected the pasture insurance proxy for $260. Um, obviously, with the drought, only harvested about 0.3 tons per acre. Uh, but you can see that triggered an indemnity of about $27,000. Uh, 
plus uh, triggered his pasture benefit as well as the hay disaster benefit. So for, for him, received about $45,000, which worked out to about $112 per acre to put towards some new feed purchases. So I just wanted to give you a high level uh, indication of where we're at for 2021. Um, we're, you know, I think getting very close to completing all of the forage insurance claims. I've listed sort of uh, just for your interest, some of the individual calculations of how things are shaking out. But when you kind of look at all of the forage related insurance, uh, we've, we've paid about $48 million uh, to producers to, to help them through the shortfall that, that you all experienced this year. I do want to note a couple of uh, additional programs related to agri insurance and forage insurance. Um, one is the establishment insurance. So, you know, if you're looking to uh, to plant some new forage acres, uh, we do have that establishment option. Uh, we also have the pasture days, um, uh, I guess, program. It used to be a pilot program. I want to say that, but it's not anymore. Uh, and it does provide coverage for days of grazing. And so, some producers find um, find that to be a really good coverage for them. We also, um, a couple of years ago, started to individualize coverage for silage corn, and so that continues. And uh, really pleased to announce a couple of, of new programs for 2022, and, and really based on the input that we've received specifically from MBP and, and uh, your directors. And so the one is a, a polycrop establishment insurance, so really uh, similar to forage establishment, but also covers those annual grazing crops. So. Uh, you know, in the discussions that we've had, it's really that that establishment that's the risk, and so we've developed a, a product for that. And as well, we've um, I would say made the definition of green feed a bit more flexible to include some um, I, I'll call them novel green feed crops as well. So hopefully that uh, will provide a bit of extra flexibility for producers. Quickly, um, before my time is up, I just want to uh, highlight livestock price insurance. We'll switch gears a little bit. Um, if I could describe livestock price insurance in a couple of words, I would say it's relative, relatively simple um, in that you're able to combine three risks into one product. So we do help, uh, that coverage does provide um, management of price, basis, and currency risk. Um, the other thing I would say about it is that it's very flexible and I'll, I'll show you an example of that in a minute. But um, the, as you know, premiums are paid by producers, but there is administration um, covered off through the agri risk program, which is funded by Canada and Manitoba. Um, the coverages range from 75 to 95% of the expected price. And uh, as I say below the calf, the calf season opened up for us last week. And so we're now publishing um, premium and coverage tables on uh, three times a week for, for that program right until uh, June. So I just popped up here the, uh, the table from Tuesday of this week. Um, you know, I think some pretty good coverage is being offered at uh, the highest one of being uh, $232 a hundred weight. Um, you know, I think going back to that, that, first or second slide with the quadrant in terms of how you approach risk management. To me, this is where you can take that and kind of apply it to this scenario and think about, um, you know, what is your risk appetite and what are you willing to pay for that? And you can see, you don't always have to purchase at the top end. Um, you know, if you're comfortable sort of locking in a floor price of say two, 210, well, you can see that that costs you a significantly amount less than what that top coverage was. So uh, just encourage you to keep an eye on it, look at all of the coverage offerings and really align that with your, your, your risk management strategy. So this uh, graph just shows um, participation in the livestock price insurance program. Um, on the left is CAF and the right is the feeder product. Uh, you can see on the calf product, we had some really good years um, through about 17 to 19, uh, where we saw lots of participation. But over the last couple of years, we've seen participation really drop off. And, you know, that's concerning to us. Um, and so what we've done is put together an industry working group. Uh, MVP is represented on that group and really trying to find ways to address uh, the you know, issues that producers have identified as reasons for not participating in the program. And so I think we're making good progress, um, hearing lots of good ideas. 
certainly one of the big ones is uh, the premium volatility. So uh, volatility in the futures markets really drives the premium cost. And so looking at ways to dampen that a little bit and make a more stable product is certainly at the, uh, the highest level of priority. And so uh, looking forward to continued involvement with the industry to try to make, a, make the product work better for producers. A couple of important deadlines for us. Um, you know, March 31st is a big one to make sure that you have all of your coverage selections um, ready. I think uh, confirmations of insurance should be coming up very shortly for you. And so, um, you know, make sure that, that you review that and make sure you've got the coverage that you want. Uh, it's also the dead, deadline for continuous hail insurance option and farmland school tax rebates. Um, June 9th is the last day to purchase a CAF policy through livestock price insurance. So, you know, also keep that in mind. So, you know, um, just in terms of where to learn more, uh, our service center staff uh, are, are ready to serve you and ready to help you. Uh, we really want to be, uh, you know, a trusted partner in your business and, and really help you walk through some of the options that are available to you. Um, you know, I'd encourage you to make an appointment to make sure that the right people are, right, are there to serve you on that particular day. We're still uh, have some people working at home due to, due to the COVID restrictions, but, um, so just uh, encourage you to call ahead. There's lots that can be done over the phone as well and through a video chat if that, uh, if that suits you as well. Our website's got lots of great information. Um, we've got a YouTube channel, uh, last year's uh, Forager Way to Success webinar is up there and we've got some more videos and webinars coming soon. And if any of you are involved in other associations or groups that you think would be helpful to hear uh, get a presentation from us, please contact us and we'll be happy to, uh, to arrange something for you. So finally, uh, just a quick summary slide of all the ways to contact us. We, um, the latest, I guess, offering is that we've now opened up an online chat feature within the MyMASC, that's the producer portal that we have. Um, we'll be looking to expand that over the coming months, but that's a, a new feature that's available. Um, but yeah, at the end of the day, um, just, uh, really encourage you to, to reach out to any of our staff and they'll be happy to help you. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Well, well, thanks, Jared, for that great presentation. And um, I encourage folks, if they have uh, questions between now and when Steve's presentation ends, you can put it in the chat. And then when we get to the question portion, uh, the correct process is to use the raise your hand function, and then I'll ask you to unmute. Um, it's, it's easier to and in not really can uh, control the, the sound here. So again, use that raise your hand function for a, a verbal question following Steve's presentation. So thanks again, Jared. I'm going to be sharing my screen here to uh, play the pre-recorded. Uh oh, our internet's unstable. Are you still there, Tyler? Okay. So what I'm going to try to do is is play this, and it just yeah it indicated that our internet is unstable. So if 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 it something falls off, Dave, I might have to get you to play Steve's presentation as as we're prepared for. But again, I'm gonna I'm gonna play it. Okay. So Tyler and Melissa, one of you guys give me the thumbs up that you can see my screen shared. And I'm hoping that the sound will work this time. Hi there. I'm Steve Bunk, Director of Ag Risk Management Resources for MNP. And thanks for giving us the opportunity to speak to the Manitoba Beef Producers Conference on AgriStability. One thing I wanna remind people about right off the bat here is to use the chat feature. We have a short question and answer period later on where we'll be joined by my colleague, Marvin Slingerland, the National Leader of Livestock Services. And so as you come upon information that uh, you're not sure about, um, formulate your question and send it in right away. 
Uh, we'll be watching for those and we'll, we'll answer some of them later. We're gonna start this off with a short eight minute clip that is actually a collaboration with your keynote speaker, Quick Dick McDick. And so uh, Quick Dick helped us out last year for the uh, uh, Canadian Beef Industry Conference. And we put together a video on agri-stability. So we're gonna take an eight minute clip where Quick Dick explains his insights on how the agri-stability um, reference margin is, is formulated or what kinds of drops might be experienced. Uh, I'm going to spend about six minutes uh, responding to Quick Dick's um, insights there, and then we'll get back together to discuss and build upon some of those concepts. Hey, Quick Dick, what are you up to, man? You look all stressed out. Man, I'm trying to figure out how responsive agri stability is going to be for me this year. <laughs> agri stability, hey? Oh, yeah, I quit using that. Uh, it's no good. But maybe I can help you. What seems to be the problem? Well, I'm trying to tell the difference between drops, but it's hard to keep track of. Do you know how many drops happen on this place in a day? Sometimes the fence drops whenever a plow wind decides to come through. I dropped the oil out of my truck. Drop my bung in the oil pail once I drop the oil. <laughs> Doug ought to usually drop about two feet when she gets this dry out. Jeez. I drop at least three to four pounds when it gets this hot out between sweating and then of course when I wash my beard once a week. There's a lot of stuff in there. Yeah. So now I need to try and keep an eye on margin drop, revenue drop, production drop, and price drop. How do you do that? Well, when it comes to price and revenue drop, here's how it works. I usually have the price drop on the new cattle trailer I'm looking to buy, and then when I buy it, I experience a severe revenue drop. So for some reason in the past, that just wouldn't trigger egg stability for me, so I got out of it. Uh, I'm not sure that's what we're talking about here. Oh, oh yeah, it is, yeah. Uh, then with production drop, obviously you want to show that every year because who would ever want to pay taxes on more production, right? Uh, Okay, I, I'm not sure this is really helping much, uh, Farmer Quick. Oh, no, come on. No, I know what I'm talking about here. Uh, now, we need to talk about margarine drop. I'm sorry, did you just say margarine drop? Yeah, that's right, margarine drop. It's kind of like watching a pig's spleen. Uh, you drop a container of margarine, and if more than 30% of the margarine comes out of the container, you know that you will qualify for agri stability. But just make sure to clean it up before the wife sees it. Okay, is there anyone out there that can give me some real advice? Fire in the hole. Probably should have taken off this protective liner here or kept it out of the fridge a little longer. Oh, my camera's on. Welcome back everybody. I hope you enjoyed that insightful vid video from Quick Dick McDick. The main misconception that uh, he was talking about there was the misconception of equating a margin drop with some other kinds of drops. So the margin drop required by any farm in Canada for agri-stability is 30% before payments trigger. That is quite different than the drop in production, price, or revenue required to trigger agri-stability. So that's what we're gonna explain here right now. Margarine is what Quick Dick gave me to work with, so I'll try my best to work with it. Margarine has several ingredients. And like margarine, the agri-stability margin also has several ingredients, three to be exact. The agri-stability margin is based on production price, which if you combine those two, it's called revenue, production times price equals revenue, minus direct input costs, okay? We're not gonna talk about the input costs right now. We'll leave some of that discussion for the Q&A that comes later. We wanna focus on the revenue component. 
and how sensitive that is to various changes that might trigger an agri-stability payment. So let's look at a couple of examples. Let's consider a margin that has $100 of revenue and $30, sorry, $70 of expenses. So 100 of revenue, 70 of expense, it's a $30 margin. Now, what's required to make that margin drop by 30%? Well, we have to take the $30 times 0.3 and you get $9. So a $9 drop equates to a 30% margin drop for this farm. But what is the $9 in relation to the $100 of revenue? Well, it's only 9%. So a 9% drop in revenue will equate to a 30% margin drop. Now a drop in revenue could be a drop in price, a drop in production, or a combination of both. Let's look at another example. A margin of $100 revenue minus $40 of expenses, so a $60 margin. What's required to make that margin drop by 30%? Well, that would be 60 times 0.3, so it would be $18. $18 is a 30% margin drop, but what is the 18 in relation to the $100 of revenue? Well, it's only 18%. So in this case, an 18% drop in revenue equates to a 30% margin drop. So what is it that determines how sensitive the revenue is going to be, the drops in revenue? to trigger those agri-stability payments? Well, it's the proportion of expenses relative to the revenue. Now, there's some videos and a tool on our website uh, that allow you to look up for your operation. If you know how your agri-stability reference margin is made up in terms of eligible revenue and eligible expense and the proportion, you can look up on a graph and see what your revenue trigger point would be. So check that out if you have some time. But for now, in the interest of time, um, I'll, I'll tell you the bottom line here for the two main sectors that uh, are represented here today, and I'll throw in grains and oil seeds for good measure. So for cow-calf and grains and oil seeds, the revenue drop, which again is defined as a production drop, a price drop, or a combination of both, Revenue drop required to trigger an agri-stability payment would vary between 13.5% and 19.5%. For feedlots, it's less than 10%. So this is very important to remember because the revenue drops, production drops, price drops required to trigger agri-stability are always less than 30% and often substantially less than 30%. So the program is very sensitive to these revenue drops. And when you consider what that margin is made up of, the three ingredients, if you look at the price, the production, the costs, payments could be driven by prices going down, production going down, costs going up, any one of those things, any combination of those things. As long as they're dropping or increasing by, by enough to, to trigger. So it's important to know the composition of your margin and how sensitive it is to various movements. So that's the important concept to remember here. Okay, we're back. What I want to do right now is to expand upon some of the concepts that we talked about in that short video clip. And I wanna start with the concept of revenue drops required to trigger agri-stability. And so what we've done, I'm gonna share my screen here so you can, you can see this, is we've developed a graph that's based on some of that simple math that uh, we, we had there in the clip. And in the clip, I spoke specifically of a farm that had a margin with $100 of revenue and $70 of expense. So that farm would be located right here at the 0.7. So this is what we call our eligible expense to eligible revenue ratio. Uh, I also spoke of another farm that had $100 of revenue and $40 of expense. And so that farm is located here at this 0.4. 
And so for starters, we're going to be looking at this line here that has the various points labeled with different percentages. And um, later on, we'll look at this orange line here, which is now in the past, but it's important to understand how it impacted some of these farms and how this feature, reference margin limiting, um, once it's removed now, makes the program much bit more beneficial for some of those farms. So, you know, as I say, we took that simple math, we, we did that for a wide range of farms and we plotted them on this graph here. So it's very simple math, the math doesn't lie. We also uh, took various industry sectors and split them into three groups. And so in group one, beef feedlots is, is right there. So we call that a high cost structure because the eligible expenses are relatively high compared to the eligible revenue. In group two, you've got beef cow calf and grains and oil seeds, uh, you know, among some other ones. They're more so in the middle of the graph here and they have what we call a moderate cost structure. And group three is composed of these farms here they have a low cost structure. And so basically, when, when you heard me say that feedlots would require a revenue drop of less than 10%, feedlots of course are in group one. And so they're located on this part of the graph, which, you know, if we trace up from the bottom, uh, you know, here's about 10% and the feedlots would be in here. So um, their revenue drop percentage required to trigger agri-stability is fairly low. The program is very responsive for them and it's always been very responsive for them. Now, if we look at the beef, cow, calf and dairy, for example, which I quoted in the short video clip as being between 13 and percent revenue drop and 19 and percent, so right in here, program isn't quite as responsive for them but that is still pretty responsive. So uh, if we're talking about a crop producer and if they had 70% uh, coverage on their crop insurance, they need a 30% drop in production. Whereas they might only need a 15% drop in production here as far as the agri-stability goes or in the revenue. So that's how this graph works. It shows you that uh, uh, the program is a little more responsive. It always has been for the, the group one farms with high cost structure of which feedlots are a part, uh, a little less responsive for group two. But now let's look at that reference margin limiting. So this orange line here represents what this line would have looked like under reference margin limiting. And the reference margin limiting made the program for some of these farms here some of them would have been beef, cow, calf, grains and oil seeds. It didn't apply to all farms like that, just certain ones depending on their eligible expense to eligible revenue ratio. It made the program less responsive because they would require a higher revenue drop. So under reference margin limiting, that farm with the 0.4 or $40 of expenses relative to the $100 of revenue would have required over a 30% drop in revenue to trigger agri-stability. So that's pretty high. Removal of the reference margin limiting has made the program much more responsive for some of the farms in this area of the graph. Now, there are two changes that occurred to agri-stability for 2020 and future years. And I wanna go through the other one here pretty quickly. The other change had to do with private insurance treatment. And so private insurance is relevant to, to this audience because um, many of you buy livestock price insurance, um, but it also applies to private hail, global ag risk solutions and just solutions. So basically when you get money out of those programs, they are no longer going to offset your agri-stability payments. They used to offset the agri-stability payments in 2019 and prior years, for 2020 and future, they're not going to offset those payments anymore. So if you just watch the boxes here, when I do my next click, 
this here represents a certain amount of private insurance for 2019, and this represents a certain amount of agri stability for 2019. Same thing for 2020, and, and watch what happens here when I click. So prior to 2020, that private insurance, the receipts from that would have reduced or potentially eliminated the agri stability. Going forward, they're going to stack on top and allow producers to double up on coverage. But as far as the coverage level for the producer, the reference margin, those receipts still go in and build that reference margin, making it more likely that you'll get higher payments in the future. But when you do get a payment, it's not gonna offset your agri stability. So that's a good deal. Now, I just briefly want to take you to our website and uh, show you where you can access some further resources on this. So if you go to our website, the uh, landing page isn't going to look exactly like this, uh, but if you click on the search here and enter in agri-stability changes, um, if you do that, it'll display the results. And the third one down here, do you know how the 2020 to 2022 National Agri-Stability Program changes impact your farm? So click read more on that and it will take you right here. Um, and there's a number of resources. I think that the key to understanding this stuff is repetition. And so you may have seen that video uh, at the Canadian Beef Industry Conference last year um, now you've seen the clip again, you've heard me talk about it a little bit more. This is just some further reading that expands upon these, these two important program changes, the removal of reference margin limiting and the treatment of private insurance proceeds. So you can read about it here. Uh, it's about an eight minute read. It gives you another explanation of the same graph that I went over. Um, and it also at the bottom, allows you to click on here and watch a short 15 minute video that explains this a little differently than I explained it today. So uh, it's all very good information. And then of course my contact information, if you click on this, will we'll take you to my uh, contact information and bio. Okay, now for the last uh, part here, before we get into the question period, I would like to um, switch the channel, if you will. Uh, I'm gonna change topics, but I'm gonna come back to agri-stability. I wanna talk about accrual accounting. And so accrual accounting is very important for you as a farmer, uh, firstly, because it enables you to keep track of your investment. I think it's very important to think of your farms as an investment. And they're generally quite a large investment. And so as an investor, you want to make sure that your investment is always increasing in value, um, that you're not um, staying the same or, or going backwards. And I know that for uh, a lot of you, um, that might come down to just maybe one metric, which is your land going up in value. I think it's beneficial to consider more than that, that it's, it's not just the land. You've got other substantial investments that comprise that, that farm investment and you operate the farm on an annual basis. So you want to make sure that you're making a good return on your investment. You don't want to be uh, in effect working for free. Uh, so that's why accrual accounting is, that's, you know, the, the why you should um, invest in some good accrual accounting, but also for you to understand the accrual accounting. So whether that involves somebody from your family taking a community college course in accrual accounting um, and or working with an accountant that can explain how to interpret these financial statements so you can see at the end of the year, how did I do? Did I stay the same? Did I move ahead? Am I moving backwards? And how can I plan for the future? What do I, what do I need to do to keep this moving forward? 
So that's the first reason why accrual accounting is important. The second reason is because agri-stability and actually other risk management programs are built on accrual accounting principles. And so this is particularly true of the agri-stability program. Um, agri-stability um, calculates their margins on a modified accrual accounting basis. So they're, they're taking cash basis information and applying inventories, accounts receivable, accounts payable. Those are all accrued accounting concepts. If you understand those from your financial statements, you will have much less trouble understanding them from an agri-stability perspective. So another reason to invest in some solid training on accrual accounting and to work with an accountant that will help interpret your statements interpret the agri-stability, help to tie those things together. Okay, we are gonna move into a question period now, and um, I'll be there for the question period. I'm gonna be joined by my colleague, Marvin Slingerland, who's the National Leader of Livestock Services. So um, we'll be back with you shortly here live. Great. <clears throat> Well, thanks to uh, to Jared and Steve for those great presentations on kind of the provincial and in more federal offerings and giving us a better understanding of, of in particular the changes to agri stability and, and how they can impact your operation. So I see we have Jared, Steve and Marvin all on screen here. I want to open up the floor now to any questions that may have come. I don't have any in the chat, but again, if you have questions, I encourage you to use the reaction tab on the bottom that allows you to raise your hand and I will get you unmuted. You see Tyler's got one. You should be prompted. There you go, Tyler. Hi guys, thanks so much for the presentation there. It's, uh, it's I think it's very timely. Um, and, uh, but, you know, for me anyways, you're, you're preaching to the saved. I'm, I'm definitely a disciple of uh, risk management. So, um, so uh, anyways, I, I thought I would uh, just ask the question kind of in the context of, you know, recovering from the, the current drought. And I, I think this is a question that could be posed to all three of you. Um, Given the the effect, uh, the impact of the of the drought on cow calf operations in Manitoba specifically, um, does it still make sense uh, for affected producers to enroll in um, agri stability or uh, on the on the forage insurance side? Um, you know some of the programs there, like the pasture insurance or the or select hay or something like that. Um, I don't know who you want to direct the question to first, but uh, I'm I'm interested to hear what you guys have to say. I think we'll direct it to to have Jared comment first, uh, and then we can pass it over to MFP. So, Jared, uh, I will. I don't think you're the co-host anymore, so I gotta ask you to unmute. There you go. Okay, perfect. Um, well, I guess my my answer to that question, Tyler, is absolutely. It still makes sense to uh, to be involved in risk management and participate, particularly in agri insurance. Um, I think a couple of points, maybe just to point to to kind of make sure you, that everyone understands. And first of all, is that um, you know we are dealing with averages, uh, so the effects of the twenty twenty one crop here won't be actually into the probable yield and premium rate calculations until 2023. Um, the other thing uh, maybe to note, I know, you know, there will be a perception that uh, that certainly yields will be impacted and probable yields for insurance purposes will be impacted and they will. Uh, but one of the changes that was introduced as a result of the forage insurance review in, uh, in 2020 was a yield cushioning. Um, benefit and so trying to take out those extreme yields both high and low to help provide more of a stable level of coverage and um, you know as we as we've seen with the hay disaster benefit um, unfortunately just because you have one bad year you can't assume that next year will be better sometimes it's not and so I think uh, always being prepared and uh, looking at your options is really important. 
Great, thanks, Jared. Um, Steve, I'm gonna ask you to unmute first and then I can also bring in Marvin here. You should have both have the ability. Um, thanks, and I'll also mention that uh, our colleague Renee Dupont is is also on the line to uh, to help us with questions as well. So if you could find her as well, um, it, it's it's kind of um, it's kind of tough to answer such a such an open ended question. You know, there's there's two ways that I could go about it. I could assume you know, certain, certain things have happened in 2021 and are, are carrying over to 2022 and answer it in that light. But that's dangerous because it, it doesn't necessarily apply to everybody. Uh, generally, the agri-stability agri program works pretty well. Um, it, it covers production loss, price loss, and cost increases. And, and so, um, the, the deadline for signing up is coming here, uh, coming up here at April 30th. And, you know, I, I would encourage people to sign up because with that reference margin limiting removed, the program is much more responsive for cow, calf and grain and oil seed producers. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's just going to be um, potentially more beneficial for them and, and more responsive to whatever situation happens in 2022. Yeah, and, and I would add, Tyler, that most of our um, most of our successful clients would have a comprehensive risk management plan, which would include egg stability, and then whether it's pasture insurance or hay insurance or livestock price insurance. And, and each program covers off a different risk. So it's usually a blend of programs that will that fit your farm and operation that will work best. Because um, you can protect all your hay and pasture production. But then if you're not in agri-stability, you're leaving off your, um, your price risk with, uh, on, the, on the cap side. So, so I think a blendable program work, works the best. Excellent. And I did unmute you, Renee, uh, as, as Steve suggested. I don't know if you have any comments. I don't have anything to add. I think Marvin and Steve covered it off. Okay, so I'm going to open up the floor again. Um, I see I got a question coming in here uh, for Jared specifically. So Jared, can you talk a bit more on pasture insurance through MASC, including how grazing days are determined and how it is triggered? So what percent drop, etc. I'm not sure if you can see that in the chat, Jared. Yeah, Carson, maybe can you unmute David? He could probably give you a better answer than I can. I will find him. Should be getting prompted, uh, Mr. Van Dyne. All right. Are you able to hear me? Yep. Yep. Fantastic. Okay. So yeah, thanks, and and thanks for for the invite here today. Faster days insurance for us is. Uh, you know, it's based on the number of days your, your livestock are out on pasture. Uh, typically, a, a brand new producer would start with, uh, you know, around 130 days, 134 days, I think it is. That is uh, sort of the guarantee, I'll call it, uh, for, for your livestock to be out on pasture. So uh, it's really, you know, in a year like last year where people delayed putting their livestock out on pasture because of how dry it was right from the spring. You know, we don't start counting days on pasture until you actually uh, release them out there. If it's again a year like last year where you're you're required to supplemental feed your livestock on their pastures or throwing bales over the fence or whatever the case may be to, to sustain them throughout the summer, that sort of uh, comes off of those totals because the recognition is that some feed is not coming directly from your pasture, it's coming from the bales that you're throwing over. Uh, so it's based on that guarantee and we look at the number of animal units, uh, you know, how many cows you have on there versus calves and that kind of thing to, to determine how, how many days you should get. Um, and, and if you're short of what your coverage is, then, then you get a payment on that basis. Uh, the coverage on a per cow per day basis, I don't have in front of me at the moment. Apologize for that. Um, I think it's two bucks, uh, an animal unit actually, um, is, is the way it looks. So if you're, if you're short an animal unit day for every day you're, you're short, it's, it's a couple of bucks, uh, to you to, to replace that feed. And, um, 
and again, and it, the coverage individualizes for you. So if you participate in the program and you report to us, uh, if you traditionally get a lot more than 134 days out of your past year, your coverage will start to reflect that over time and uh, we'll build from there. So. And Laura just had a follow-up uh, that in addition, does it work the same if cattle are on AMCP community pastures? Yeah, so there is um, there is some provision for that as well. Um, and it gets perhaps a little more complicated because uh, often the producer doesn't have the flexibility to, to do, you know, uh, some different management practices there. But let me, I don't recall that, Jared. I don't know if you can recall how that works there. It's very interesting. Or even David Teru is on as well. I don't know, I hate to put them on the spot too, but perhaps. Uh, yeah. yeah, that one. We might have to follow up on that one. I, I can't recall off the top of my head. Oh, that's that's fine. I think if, if there can be some follow-up done um, sure. to put that information out, it would be appreciated. Okay. Um, any other further questions for our, our great presenters here? I, oh, I see one coming in. Piggybacking on that, are custom cattle grazing on pasture covered with kick pasture insurance? So I'm not sure I understand entirely uh, what is the situation specifically. So you own the cattle and and you are grazing them somewhere else or you are providing the pasture for another client, I suppose. So I've uh, asked Sarah to unmute Sarah and Christian there. Oh, they're providing the pasture, I see. So you yes. own the cattle and someone else is providing the pasture. Again, the other uh, way around, yeah. Other way around, yeah. The other They're way providing around. the pasture, right? So it's it's the it's the livestock owner that that applies for for pasture insurance, because um, they are in our minds the ones who have the, the vested interest. So uh, it would be driven by the, the people who own the livestock themselves. Um, and again, I, I think that would qualify, provided we establish that the uh, pasture. Um, you know, was in fact short for, for whatever reason, that sort of thing. So I, I think we're, we're good there, but it is the, the livestock owner that applies and in our minds carries the risk with, with, that, with that arrangement. So. Great, thanks for those comments. Uh, I'm gonna give one, one last call for questions if anybody has any. I have a question in the chat, a copy of the presentations today to share with coworkers. Um, I, I think you know, Jared's nodding along. I can talk with you, Steve, af, uh, offline if you prefer, but that, yeah. And we'll get uh, you know, that, that made available. Okay. Um, with that, I, I'm not seeing any more questions come in. Uh, I truly thank, uh, all our presenters here this morning on the BRM program section. Um, it was uh, you know, very informative. And I think when you think about the, the weather patterns we've been experiencing over the last number of years, it's important to know all the tools available uh, for producers to, to access. So I appreciate you, you, you jumping on and giving us this, uh, this good overview. Now, looking at the agenda, I am just seeing we're a couple minutes ahead and we're going to be ha be joined by Brian Perley of Canfax, who, who many of you will be aware of or have heard the name before, um, and his bio is in the program, and he's going to give a, a, a general market update. I'm just waiting for him to join the meeting. I think he might be running a bit late, so what I'm going to do is just uh, give him a quick quick call, see where if he is running late, and then we'll get him uh, teed up here. Unless Brian, you're on and you have a different tag, um, you uh, if you do, just unmute your video so I you come to the front. Okay, so we'll just I'll just ask you to just hold on a just a quick minute here.
I think uh, Brian is here now. So Brian, you should be getting a prompt to uh, be made co-host. So you'll be able to share your screen and, and unmute your video and your, your audio. So once you jump on, I will stop, stop my side of things. Okay, um, I can do my video. Oh, good. All right. Okay. Yeah, you're you're co-host now, so it should be good. All right. Sorry, I guess. Uh, are you ready for me to roll here? Yeah, we're right ready. Oh, okay. Well, hope I didn't keep you waiting. Um, just see. I'll try and share my screen. Um, so is that? Uh, you can see everything sound okay, look okay. Yep, right on, thanks guys. All right, well, uh, I guess I'll jump right into it. Um, so I'm gonna give just a quick update. I guess I'm probably between you guys and lunch. Um, just a broad overview of the markets, what what, what we're, we're seeing these days. And um, I, if there's time for questions okay. after, I've got some time. All right. Okay, well, starting off, um, obviously, you know, 2021 has been, uh, been a bit of a mixed year. I think uh, there's, there's two sides to this story. Uh, obviously, very strong demand. We've seen amazing international demand. Just got our export numbers, you know, uh, for 2021, um, you know, record setting by far, you know, uh, as to where we were. And domestic and, uh, you know, U.S., North American demand, we can call it very, very strong as well. Um, you know, these just starting off, we've got U.S. cutout prices here. And uh, again, besides besides the real blip in 2020 when, uh, you know, the packing plants went down, you know, we have had record high uh, wholesale beef prices. And reminder, this is U.S. Uh, choice cutouts in converted to Canadian dollars uh, as we're, we're still struggling to get Canadian boxed beef prices. Um, and uh, again, starting the year here for 2022, uh, there's a little bit of Omicron issues at the plants, you know, minor slowdowns. Uh, but again, we always see these little hiccups and instantly kind of beef shoots higher and cattle prices go down. We just get this backlog almost instantly, uh, very minor again. But again, we're not processing all the cattle in a timely manner. And uh, that puts pressure on our cattle prices. So. The great story is demand. The real frustrating story is the demand for cattle just continues to lag or continues to struggle. Uh, and you know, he also got to point out here the fact that we saw record high beef price prices, uh, our wholesale and retail beef prices prices uh, amidst uh, record large beef production. So we had the biggest North American largest beef production last year, and these huge prices. So uh, hence the demand story is very very positive. And again, the, the record production speaks to the volume of cattle we've been processing and, 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 and in the works. Um, you know, the U.S. has pretty much near record cattle on feed numbers right now, drought, all of these things, just keeping the supply chain full. And uh, last year, they, they processed an extra 330,000 cows in the United States as well, on top of these large cattle on feed numbers. So hence the disconnect somewhat between beef and cattle. But I think the opportunity is there, and hopefully we'll talk a bit more about that changing here going forward. And just for perspective, uh, this green line is 2015. So we think back, you know, our fat cattle prices back then were about $2 at the high. In that summer period in 2015, we had $2 fats. You know, here we are today, these kind of cutout values and our fat cattle are, you know, barely 160, a little over 160. So hence the disappointment, but on the other hand, the opportunity to get more of those dollars to flow back. And you can see on the right hand side, really, that's just showing it's not just beef. You know, we, we often track how does red meat, to beef, and pork move together. Despite these extremely strong prices for beef, they're really still competitive with pork. Um, and, uh, you know, that's, uh, you know, uh, a good indicator, again, of strong demand across the board for red meat. We'll have to see inflation. You know, these kind of high prices are leading inflation. We saw US inflation up here. Uh, to the highest point in 40 years and uh, you know food is sort of leading that inflation so it's catching some attention um, and something we need to be concerned about a little bit in terms of you know how many dollars do consumers have to spend beef is the luxury good and um, you know the high inflation does eat into disposable income and this could be a little bit of a headwind we've got to watch 
jumping along, looking at globally, um, you know, global wise, you know, we've had a constant growth in consumption and demand for meat, you know, as we, it's not just so much about population, but it's really about wealth. And as we move into some of these developing countries, Asia, uh, you know, the, the number in China, the number of people moving into middle class is really what drives beef demand. Uh, you know, as they grow, as they gain wealth, they want to eat more meat, you know, which is usually chicken and pork, and then it ultimately is beef. And uh, again, China has been the world's biggest importer of meat. You know, for years we were lucky and still are. We were, we're on, on top of one of the biggest importers, but China went from almost a decade ago to being hardly on the radar for beef imports to now a global leader. But the other side of this too is the fact that it's very rare that we see two years in a row where we see global reductions in meat consumption or production. Basically, you can only going to eat what you produce. And with African swine fever stepping in and hitting China, and now these high, high grain prices, uh, you know, Europe's had some struggles on their hog industry as well. Um, and very high grain prices usually, you know, sort of limits uh, the growth in poultry, chicken, and beef to some extent too. So uh, we've got extremely strong demand and we got a little bit of shrinking meat supplies, you know, bodes well for prices longer term or medium term, I guess you could say. The big driver of everything you've got to really watch is US. Uh, the black line here is production. So as I said, we had record beef production in North America last year um, and those high prices. But the here's where the positive side, I think, really starts is, or should start to shine, hopefully sooner than later. But again, there's, there's drought and cows to work through, but shrinking cattle numbers. So from 2015 to 2019, the U.S. cattle herd increased, or the cow herd, just beef cows grew about 2.6 million beef cows they added to their herd. And in the last three years, we've taken 1.6 million of those cows out. Um, so again, um, you know, and we really didn't expand packing capacity that much. Uh, a lot of it was just through extra Saturday kills and, and uh, you know, sort of backing up cattle at, at times. So again, the new, the positive story is, and consider on top of this, while we've dropped the cow herd, 1.6 million cows, we've got near record cattle on feed numbers. You know, the number of feeders and calves going to be available in 2022 and 2023 and likely 2024 are uh, going to be very price supportive. Um, you've got less of those around. We're going to have less cattle at the processing plants. We'll find a better equilibrium. If demand remains strong, there's a lot of dollars that can flow back to producers and uh, pretty optimistic, I guess, for calf prices going forward. As we've gone through sort of the peak of this cycle, now we're, we're into some sharply lower cattle numbers in the next year or two. Um, feeder, and I, you know, I don't have the chart, but feeder supplies outside of feedlots are the lowest since 2015. They're still about 800,000 bigger than 2015, but uh, they certainly shrunk quite a lot last year. As I mentioned off the top, exports phenomenal. Uh, we just got in the latest data. So exports up about 20% in volume, 37% uh, in value. So we were close to $4.5 billion in exports considering last year we were, we've set record high values. You can see in 2020 here, uh, we saw a setback in volume just due to production issues, but we still hit a record in value. So um, um, again, we've, we've set record high values, I think, since 2016. And then again, we increased export values of over a billion dollars just in a year for 2021. So uh, huge demand, imports realigned lower. Obviously, we saw a surge last year as you know, people were just scrambling to find beef to put on retail shelves. Um, so we've seen that kind of moderate back to this, this weakening trend somewhat of, uh, of less imports uh, coming in. Showed you the, the kind of the purple or the, the beef U.S. numbers, uh, the, the bars for purple cattle, the purple bars on that previous U.S. charts are showing the growth and sort of decline. You know, we really didn't see much of a bump. I suppose there's maybe a little bump here in 20 sort of stabilization at best, uh, but we continue to shrink our herd. We're the smallest herd in 30 years, um, and that kind of goes across all provinces. Uh, you know, there's been areas of Manitoba that were hit a little bit more, but for the most part, whether it's Ontario or, you know, across, across the West, uh, we've all shrunk our herd significantly since that peak. And we're going to be shrinking some more this year. Um, probably the good news is I don't think, uh, or it's not going to be anywhere near some of the numbers that were, you know, getting thrown around this summer. Um, 
uh, were, were rather significant. I think I have another slide on that. One thing I do want to point out, though, the challenge we really focus on or, or not focus on or have, uh, maybe same thing, but, um, you know, is this forage and pasture land, uh, the competition that way, uh, you know, realistically, you know, our cow herd peaked in 2015, right, right around when tame hay and pasture and and uh, as well peaked. And we've lost, since then, we've lost about 28% of our hay land, tame hay land, and we've lost about 33% of our cows. So I know some of the larger operations are going to silage and more annual crops, but, you know, obviously that trend around land use is real um, and the competition's tough. And, you know, I've often promoted, it's not necessarily competing with green land, it's, it's complementing the green land, which we've lost with mixed farms and bigger grain operations that don't don't really entertain cows and to me that's where the opportunities are but uh it's challenging to to work sometimes with or their willingness to work with cattle producers so this trend around land is is definitely uh, a key area and we'll be we'll have new census data here hopefully by may of this year or we'll see this spring uh, usually trickles out in, in chunks but we'll have some uh some uh, more census data here coming out in a few months this is what I was talking about on the culling rate. You know, it really wasn't that bad. It, it was rather surprising to some extent. Uh, you know, in cow-calf guys, they, uh, you know, it doesn't matter where you are across the prairies. Uh, Eastern Canada had great crops. You know, they had phenomenal crops and lots of moisture. So it's two different worlds there. But even in the West, uh, we saw just a modest decline in cows. Uh, you know, we saw yearlings go. We saw a lot of bred heifers go. Our, our you know, we're definitely going to shrink the breeding herd, but for the most part, you know, a lot of these cow-calf guys are pretty resilient at finding some sort of feed. Obviously, salvaging crops was huge this year and, and some late fall open grazing. Um, but for the most part, you know, we're only going to see a modest decline in our, in our breeding cow herd over this past year, um, which is, you know, maybe a little bit of relief for, for the industry or for the, the associations. We'll have, and that said, we'll have better, we'll have the stats can data uh, probably within a month. Usually it's early March. It did fluctuates a little bit. So, so here's the interesting part, uh, you know, the, the interesting on terms of you saw, you know, U.S. cattle numbers rebuild and then they've shrunk a little bit record large beef production. Canada's actually done even has been even more aggressive in the growth in beef production. You saw the shrinking cow herd. Uh, for years going on, but our feedlot sector's grown significantly, uh, continues to grow. It's it's a little bit head scratching for sure. We we've imported a pile of feeders. We're importing corn. A um, little bit you know cautious about this market right now, but uh, from the feedlot side, but from the cow calf side, that's great because you've got amazing demand for calves. We got newer feedlots. We've got a little bit of feedlot or uh, packing capacity expansion in Western Canada too. So. Uh, but overall, I think it's around, we've, we've increased production from our 2015 low about 30%, and the U.S. is only up like 17 or 18%. So we've actually grown our beef production faster than the U.S. with, uh, you know, growth in our feedlot and, and a little bit of expansion in the packing sector. So probably going to see that uh, level off. It's going to be challenging for the feedlots. Um, and Manitoba is well positioned. Uh, you know, you've seen phenomenal demand. Ontario feedlots, they got cheaper feed, higher fed prices. They're aggressive on the feeder market. So in Manitoba, and we're seeing more interest out of the U.S. So quite often, uh, uh, you know, Manitoba feeder and calf prices are some of the strongest in Canada. If you can put those, uh, you know, good string of feeder cattle together, uh, and that looks positive and looks to be strong. Uh, the, I don't know if you're following the futures right now, they're almost continuously hitting um, contract highs. You know, they're all, everybody's kind of anticipating. Got to be cautious out there, but definitely lots of people anticipating some, some stronger prices in the marketplace with, again, very strong demand and less cattle around and less hogs around as well. Just on this trade side of things, just to put in, how did we grow beef production with our cows being the smallest herd in 30 years? Well, you know, we've, we've limited how much we export now, uh, or not limited, just the market's kind of driven that in terms of keeping more cattle in Canada. Uh, and then these imports are just huge. We're, you know, we're going to be a net importer of about 250,000 feeders. Um, we imported around 350,000, give or take, and we're going to export about 100,000. 
So um, we're still been a large net importer feeder cattle. That's how we've really grown our beef production. But that's likely going to shift a little bit. As I said, more U.S. buyers up here than, and we may see our that net exports uh, kind of level right off. Um, you know, with probably a few more exports going south and and less imports coming up. But uh, yeah, we've um, certainly seen some trade flow difference changes in the last three four years. Prices wise, uh, you know, here we talk about fed cattle prices and that's the thing. Let's, you know, uh, last year we were, oh, I should know, second or third. I think we were the second highest fed, Western Canadian and Alberta fat prices were the second highest in history, just slightly above uh, 2014 and 2017, 2018. But we had the second highest fed cattle prices, but it certainly didn't feel like that. Feedlots were not making money. They had bid in lots of dollars into the calves and feed costs. Uh, but we did see a pretty strong finish to the year on fats. Here we're struggling. Um, you know, we got border issues. We had the Omicron. Some of the plants were not killing full weeks. So we had a bit of a backlog of cattle, really. And uh, Packer's still not aggressive on buying even this week you know we're seeing bids from wide ranging from 260 to 275 you know depending if it's limited volumes or to help guys out a little bit but um not a real good market clearing price so we're still struggling despite demand being strong um and you know just this uncertainty of moving cattle so moving boat beef south through coots is, is really throwing a, a wrench into the system that we really don't need right now um so and we've got big cattle on feed numbers. We're, our cattle on feed numbers are well above a year ago. So uh, um, again, lots of optimism, but we've got some, uh, we've got uh, a bit of some hurdles uh, to get through these cattle that are facing us today in the next few months. Um, but again, that's on the feedlot sector. If you're calves and feeders, uh, seeing really good demand there. We've seen calves really shoot up this week, man. This is Manitoba price. It's kind of you know, some weeks we don't have prices in the summer and such, but, you know, we've seen some five weight calves this week cracking 250, even to 260 in spots here. So, and again, a lot of that futures have been extremely strong and uh, cattle numbers are tightening up. We moved a lot of cattle last fall calves, hence we got big numbers on feed. There's not as many out there and uh, the market optimism is, is quite strong. I would say, I'm just thinking of this as I'm going, you know, definitely got to look at uh, price insurance. Uh, there's some really good coverage, you know, into the 230s kind of range on calves, uh, backgrounded calves, calves off grass or feeders, stalkers, 220 some into the, into the fall. Um, you know, these great runs in the futures is uh, definitely adds to your price insurance coverage and, and have a look at that because there's a lot of risk out there. The basis, uh, I think, the next slide shows about basis risk. So, you know, the dollar could shoot up, grain prices shoot up, or this basis stays incredibly weak. Uh, if we've got a lot of cattle on feed or have any other hiccups in our supply chain in Canada, uh, price insurance covers all of that risk and it's offering some pretty good price levels. So just plug for that, but it's important. But here, you know, uh, last year, so this blue line, you know, in, in the spring or second quarter, um, you know, Canadian prices were phenomenal. Western Canada had the strongest fat prices in, in, the, in uh, North America. Uh, and this is $20 a hundredweight. So just to put in, so that's per hundredweight. So on a fed steer, if they're 1500 pounds steer, that's 300 bucks a head above the US. Now we're around, we're pushing almost 20, might come up a little bit this week, but now we're $300 below the US market. And again, coots, things with the border, uh, we're not moving cattle south for arbitrage. Uh, so it's a struggle. And again, part of that price insurance is, is offering some very good coverage that protects you against if this basis stays weak. You know, our fat prices right now are about 163 so or so this week. And uh, was it last week? Or you could buy price insurance into May for 182, for example. So, um, way higher uh, protection available and in case we continue to have some issues here. So hopefully as we work through our cattle numbers, I think part we imported all these feeders, um, you know, we got lots of cattle on feed and we're having a bit of a struggle moving products south. So hence the basis is weakened out. Hopefully as, you know, as I said, more feeders go south um, and these cattle numbers tighten up, hopefully our basis, I'd expect our basis to tighten up some. It's hard to say if it'll go to par in the summer as it normally does. 
Um, but uh, hopefully we're more into that zero to 10 range uh, uh, rather than 10 to 20. That's a, and just put in perspective, uh, if, if we're talking about a $10 basis for the industry um, versus a $20 basis, again, on your price of calves, um, 150, uh, that $10 move in a basis is about 150 bucks. So you're talking 25, 30 cents on the price of your calves in the fall uh, difference. So if we think, if the basis stays at a minus 20 rather than a minus 10, you've got to take that off your calf prices because um, the feedlots aren't getting paid the money in their pockets to pass it along. Feeding sector, and it's all over the map. I'll just touch on this briefly. It's Again, this is purely cash margins, assumes no risk management. Uh, you're buying calves, you're buying feed, and you're selling fats on the market. You haven't done any contracts. There's been some opportunities, price insurance or basis contracts or hedging. Um, so again, hasn't been very friendly for this feeding sector, which again is a little bit of a head scratcher with why we're importing so many feeders and grain, but there's been some really good contracts out there, fats and well into the 180s for certain time frames, uh, or quite a few for the low, low 180s uh, for time frame. So we've, we've got some good contracting opportunities. That is what also is supporting cap and feeder market, but the feeding sector, uh, you know, we haven't seen the run in the Fed prices to get them to, to the large profits that they've seen in the past. Other couple other main factors, um, talking about the dollar, uh, it's, it's, you know, it's been relatively steady. It's kind of just jumping around between 78 and 80 cents. That's not a bad range, realistically, I think for the dollar. Um, but it's really a lot. So that's going to depend on oil in the U S we get into these inflationary periods, the U S as I said, high inflation, are they going to start increasing inflation or uh, interest rates? Uh, Canada may have to follow suit. So it could be a little bit of volatility around the dollar as well, but for the most part, it, it's, it's tucking along, uh, in a rather flat trading range. It's more of, it starts creeping above 80, 82 cents. Uh, then again, that's going to take a bite out of our prices. Uh, if it starts going the other way, that would definitely be positive. And these feed grain prices are, you know, a little bit crazy. It's interesting here. Finally, there was, there was another whole transportation issue challenge. Um, you know, we were, we had feedlots almost scraping the bottom, you know, 20,000 head feedlots scraping the bottom of their bins for corn or barley is certainly not a position anybody wants to be in. So that also was supporting spot prices for grain. But again, Alberta's got a large feed cost disadvantage. Uh, but we have seen those prices come down probably 20, 30 bucks a ton here. So we've gotten about 10, a couple of weeks with 10 full rail train loads of cars coming up to uh, help uh, kind of get us a little bit of inventory around us. But again, we're still, even over 410, uh, we're still at a feed cost disadvantage uh, to the US. We'll definitely hopefully get some better weather uh, across Western Canada this year. But um, we're still seeing, uh, you know, we're going to basically we're relying on U.S. corn to get us through through that. I'll talk a little bit more on those, those implications. So here's the, you know, here's the here's the summary. Um, it's a chart, but it, it's, it's basically comparing what how do cattle prices, fed cattle prices compared to wholesale prices. As I showed, wholesale prices were extremely high and fed cattle prices, you know, they've been kind of average or slightly above the five year average. So basically what that means, you know, the producers are getting a smaller share of, um, of, the, of the dollars, of the consumer dollars, ultimately. And as cattle numbers tighten up, and basically as the herd has grown and production and, uh, and slaughter capacity has kind of been tapped out or the bit of the bottleneck, you know, less and less dollars flow to us. But we've seen, we saw an uptick late last year. And, uh, you know, there's definitely, as these cattle numbers, if we're taking, talking over a million, million and a half less cows and breeding stock around, uh, that's going to make the packing plants compete more for, for protein. And there's lots of dollars. They have huge, big margins. There's no, no hiding around that. And they can pass those dollars down to the, to the feeding stock sector. But to put into perspective, if we get back from 50% to 55%, kind of that longer term average, if we got 5% more, assuming these cutout prices stay where they are, that's about 300 bucks a head um, to back to the producers. And feedlots bid that into calves. That's, you know, that's about 50 cents a pound on calf prices. 50 cents a pound just by if we had this leverage or a, 
you know, regain our leverage to uh, get more of the dollars flowing back. So hence, you know, the frustration to start, but here's the opportunity for, you know, cow-calf producers to get a lot more money out of the system here. Uh, this fall compared to last fall, let's say. And the futures already pricing some of that in. As I said, these futures have been rallying. They're hitting hitting new levels. April futures way up to 148 today. So those are some of the highest levels we've seen in years. So hence, the market's already anticipating that. Why? That's part of the reason we're seeing such good demand for, for these calves and feeders. Um, but um, yeah, hopefully, you know, we go on these flat trading ranges. Usually when there's a breakout, it's, it's a pretty significant breakout. And that's the nice part technically on the market side and fundamentally uh, we can be seeing some, some better prices, uh, hopefully by later this year. This is kind of just uh, a, a larger matrix of uh, prices and, and feed costs. I'll just, you know, I'll just even pause. So I talked about uh, the, um, you know, 50 cents a pound if, if we got more of the consumer dollars flowing back to, to cow calf producers. Not 50 cents a pound would be like on a 550 weight steer. That's on calves, not on fat cattle. Uh, and cost again is, is, is kind of crazy what it's taken out of the market as well. I, rough rule of thumb is for every dollar a bushel barley uh, barley or corn goes up for a dollar bushel calf price has got to go down about 20 cents for let's say the the market saying fats are going to be 180 barley's now a dollar a bushel more they got to pay 20 cents less for your calves so if you do the math on that we got go from nine dollar barley back to 650 barley two and a half bucks that's 50 cents a pound on your calves um you know, we're going to need weather to cooperate in the U.S. I'm not saying that's for sure going to happen. But again, on a more sort of a reliable and uh, uh, equilibrium grain market, uh, if we were off 250 a bushel, which is still barley at 650 is extremely high price or quite a high price. Um, again, that's another 50 cents to your calf prices as well on top of the other. So that's basically what I'm saying. That's a dollar a pound. Between the leverage and feed cost, we're off close to a dollar a pound that we've maybe lost on an opportunity on calves. Um, lost or just not there because of the market situation and green prices where they are. So again, that's where the optimism kind of lies and comes in and the opportunity for upside potential here. But this is just showing here's the futures markets and there, gosh, I got these, I really got to keep jacking these higher because uh, 110 is long gone but you know almost all of the futures are 38 40 two uh, and higher but again when these cost of gains are up 160 70 you know we're still only around two dollar calves but again we get back to uh you know more traditional you know we used to be double below a dollar lots but you know 260 280 calves i was just showing how much these feed grains impact that and again, as I said, there's futures actually projecting higher. So again, these numbers are a lot more exciting than maybe what we're seeing today. Um, but uh, you know, the things are sort of aligning as 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 they could here for the grain side. So industry trends uh, kind of wrap up a little bit. You know, again, shrinking North American herd. That's probably one of the biggest. Uh, you know, the supply kind of drives the price trend, and the demand. The demand is what really shows the magnitude in the price changes. So we're going to have a positive uh, market situation from shrinking numbers and very, you know, uh, very compounded by very strong demand. So we got to have. We need that demand to hold for a lot of these assumptions to go. Inflation, some things like that. We have to be aware of and again lack of revenue bright red is is the challenge as we've talked about there's there's a lot more dollars in the system but they are not going to producers we know that um we've been through these cycles before where we produce a whole bunch you know we get good prices we grow the herd and then three four years later we're like well we got too many cattle you know uh the system's getting backed up prices go down and then it takes two more years to clear that system by the time you start taking all these cows and this bigger calf crop you just produced and and then throw in COVID it's it's been a bit of a it's been extreme no doubt about it um it's a slow turning ship that's basically what I'm saying global you know protein demand growing uh very good talked about the land side of things and you know the challenges and again I always I kind of go back you know beef industries to complement grain land not really compete with it 
uh, is part of it and technology and other things uh, to see see improvements and growth and, and labor challenges uh, maybe dealt with at all sectors, especially the packing plants and feedlots uh, uh, to reduce the, the manpower needed. I will say we've got uh, the mobile site, the Canfax mobile site. Um, uh, to just have a look at that, you go to canfax.ca and you can, you can go on there. And we've got the insurance tables. You can just click and you can see the futures and the charts and everything and do some calculations. You know, this is, I don't even know which day this was on, to be honest. Uh, I guess later January, you know, if you put in, what do you think prices of calves are going to be this fall? And this was at 248. And we've seen the futures rally since then. Um, so again, you, you can kind of get an impact. It's tied in, right? To what's the dollar done? What's the futures done? What does that do to my projected calf price? And again, this is for the fall of 2022 type thing. And there's other calculators there. So here's our website. Here's this, go to this banner to, if you want to go to the mobile site. Um, yeah, if you want more market information, Canfax for membership based. And um, we are, uh, yeah, if, if you want, we've got weekly reports. Uh, we've got, um, um, you know, the analysts in the office you can call. And for cow calf producers, $175 for the year. I'll also point out we are hiring. We're looking for market analysts and, uh, and some research coordinators. Um, I guess I don't know if people know, but I'm, I'm actually moving on from Canfax at the end of February, at the start of March. So not sure if people were aware of that, but I guess they can sort of public now. So um, throw that out there, but uh, uh, that's my presentation. And that's, that's how you get a hold of Canfax or me for the next couple of weeks. Well, thanks, Brian. Uh, you know, we always appreciate your informative uh, market presentations and updates, and we're going to, you know, miss you on, on this side of it, but do we know you're still going to be in the ag sector and that's, uh, that's the good thing. So all the mm -hmm. best uh, in the future. So I want to open up for a couple minutes of potential questions like before. Um, if you want to, if you have anything you want to put in the chat or raise your hand so I can unmute you, uh, we'll give a couple minutes here. You can probably stop sharing your screen, Ryan. <clears throat> Comments, questions? I see Tyler. He's pitching at something. He always has something. It's good, though. Unmute. There you go. Yeah. Well, thanks so much, Brian. I uh, always super appreciate your uh, your insight on on the markets. You've been a force over the last uh, what 10, 12 years or so. Um, Twelve years in April. Yeah. 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 Anyways, um, thank you so much, and I, uh, I I'm I'm glad you're uh, you're <laughs> you know you're still going to be uh, accessible. Hopefully. Um, just to get some some feedback, there's so many moving parts in this market, uh, and it's I, I as optimistic as you are, and it, it it sounds, and um, and as optimistic as I am, um, I'm, I, I think it's it's pretty critical to note that there's a lot of things that uh, that can throw a wrench into things. So, one of those things in my mind is the the current Fed basis levels. It's just a shocker to me that we can go you know, from plus 20 to minus 20 and, you know, in a, in whatever, eight to 10 months. Um, how much of that Fed influence, how much of that Fed influence is going to uh, show up on, on calf prices and, you know, kind of following up to that, what, uh, what's the top side potential of uh, fall calf prices? Uh, yeah, the basis is, is a concern. Um, you know, man, you got a little bit of protection in Manitoba. Uh, luckily, you know, Ontario's enjoying is rocking right along, you know, their fat market there. We were even sending fats over to Ontario. Uh, and you got the U S markets kicking in as they're, like I said, their numbers are tightening up and they're tightening up pretty fast. Once this, they're going through some drought pressure. So, uh, you know, that might cushion, I think, especially even Manitoba a little bit more from uh, some of this basis risk. But as I said, you know, 
you can easily take, you know, the 10, 10 bucks on the basis. That's, you know, 30 cents off, off the potential calf market. Um, um, and yeah, the grain, gosh, you know, where's grain going to go? That's, that's, you know, I, I, as I said, it, it could easily add 50 cents to the upside on our calf market, but it, it may not help us at all if we continue to see strong demand for grain. We got to remember U.S. corn is rallying extremely high and they had the second biggest corn crop ever last year. So I'm kind of get pretty bullish on, you know, as I said, there's 50 cents. We kind of, I don't know, you know how you want to, we didn't lose it. We gave it up or whatever due to this rallying grain market, but I, I'm not sure we're really going to get how much of that we're going to get back. So um, I don't know if that, uh, that kind of answers your question. On the upside, like the upside, yeah, there's lots there. 50 cents in leverage, 50 cents on grain. There's, there's a buck a bushel. It, you know, could even be a little bit more, to be honest. Um, you know, and that's from last fall. So last fall, you got to think we were, you know, we were two, two, ten. So then you're three, ten. But timing is when. I'm not going to guarantee it's going to be there this fall, but hopefully next two to three years, we start to see some good calf prices. Thanks, Brian. Um, and, and I have a... M. Jackson, I believe Matt Jackson, uh, I'll ask you to unmute for comment or question. Are you there? Hello. Not hearing anything come in, and it says he's unmuted. So, uh, apologies, Matt. Um, if you can potentially put any questions in the chat um, or comments, but yeah, we can't can't hear you on your end. I see one from uh, a question in the chat here, Brian, and then I think we'll wrap up. But with the legislation in the U.S. on price transparency from slaughter pants, how long uh, do for that money to trickle down? Yeah, yeah, and I think, you know, ultimately it's, you know, some of the market and volumes are going to take care of itself. It, it's once we, we, once you get the hook space to really more in balance with fed cattle supplies, challenges with some of this legislation and, and new plants, they're, they're not going to be online for a year or two. So um, by then, honestly, I, I'm hoping the market's already fixed by then, uh, just strictly due to shrinking cattle numbers. Um, as I mentioned, cattle on feed numbers big, you know, the next six months um, may, may uh, especially in Western Canada, may still, we've, we've got a lot of cattle to work through, but I'm, I'm hoping by the end, towards the second half of 2022, we start to see things realign and hopefully in time for the fall run, let's put it that way, is, is, is what I'm sort of hoping for. Great. I'm going to try to unmute Matt one more time. And if uh, it doesn't work, we'll have to move on and let you go, Brian. Okay. It says you're unmuted, Matt. I'm not sure what the issue is. Okay. Well, in terms of time, again, Matt, if you can answer, if you want to put your comment in the, or question in the chat box, for some reason, it is not allowing you to speak it's, it says you're unmuted so this is you know, odd to me but uh perhaps if you have a question later on in the agenda and you can get your side of things going um you can raise it then but with that thanks again brian um for taking the time to give us that update and it's always appreciated so we're going to take a short health break now on the agenda i encourage you to stay logged in uh because in about 10 minutes i will play some information on the uh, recent changes to agri recovery and how it relates to to that program, uh, such as the expansion of uh, eligible expenses uh, underneath that program. So I'll play that in about ten minutes and allow you to get grab some lunch, take that health break, and we're going to plan to start our business portion of the agenda at twelve fifty five sharp. Uh, we'll have some speakers after that, um, including uh, Casey uh, Vanderplug from the uh, National Cattle Feeders Association and a quick Dick McDick, 
the uh, YouTube sensation. So stay tuned for that and have a good uh, lunch break here. Welcome to this presentation on extraordinary expenses. What are they and how do you claim them? Extraordinary expenses are a new component of the Livestock Feed and Transportation Drought Assistance Program. This program helps primary producers source feed in order to maintain their breeding herds over winter. The extraordinary expenses are unique from the uh, rest of the program in that you do not have to submit invoices or proof of payment. Instead, one time you will submit a declaration of extraordinary expenses that you have incurred. Four types of expenses that you can claim for the cost of maintaining your breeding herd due to drought are accessing extra pasture, forage, and crop acres in order to, for them to graze or produce feed, harvesting feed that you produced on acres that you don't normally use for livestock feed production, sourcing water for your livestock due to drought, and... Tr From the city streets to the country roads, the Nissan Qashqai and transporting feed that you produced from distant locations. Examples of eligible expenses for accessing extra acres include were anything uh, additional pasture for supplemental grazing or renting extra cropland in order to plant more green feed or silage. Materials for temporary fencing for supplemental grazing are also eligible. For harvesting acres not normally used for feed, the eligible activities would include harvesting those extra acres that you seeded to produce livestock feed, crops that were seeded as a cash crop, but then the harvesting activity uh, as a livestock feed. So the harvesting as livestock feed would be eligible. Uh, sloughs, ditches, and other acres that were not normally harvested. The cost of baling slough hay, for example, or ditch hay would be eligible. Feed harvested from acres you do not rent, own, or lease. An example would be if you had to uh, bale your neighbor's straw or purchased a field of standing corn to make silage, those harvesting activities would be eligible. And finally, if there was annual crop regrowth on any of your acres, uh, the harvesting activity there would be eligible as well. For all of this harvesting, the eligible uh, invoice uh, costs include any custom harvesting fees that you had as well as the fuel and paid labor for using your own equipment. For sourcing drinking water, the eligible costs are custom hauling and custom pumping, rental of pumps and water lines, fuel and paid labor to use your own uh, trucks or your own uh, pumps to move the water. For transporting feed that you produced, you can claim the expenses associated with uh, hauling feed for trips where it was a minimum a distance of 40 kilometers loaded, and you can claim the expenses associated with, with up to the first 600 kilometers of each trip. The expenses that are eligible are custom hauling, as well as the fuel and paid labor to use your own trucks and equipment to move the feed. In this case, the amount you can claim as an extraordinary expense is limited to the ton kilometer rates that the program pays for purchase feed. If you're self hauling, it is high, highly unlikely that these rates will be a factor However, if you are custom hauling, it is possible that based on these rates, uh, you'll have to uh, limit the amount uh, claimed for custom hauling. In that case, it is suggested that you uh, see how uh, these rates are applied, either by referring to our program guide or the fact sheet on our website for examples of calculating transportation claims for purchased feed. Basic costs eligible as extraordinary expenses include rental of acres for grazing and feed production, purchasing and renting materials for temporary fencing for supplemental grazing, custom charges for harvesting, hauling, and pumping, and the fuel and paid labor for using your own equipment. Examples of ineligible expenses include in-kind labor, equipment depreciation and repair, and infrastructure such as digging a new well or installing permanent fencing. Reduced yield, lost market value, and cost of purchasing feed cannot be declared as an extraordinary expense. Expenses related to feed sold or acres normally harvested are not eligible. Feed processing, such as feed milling and tub grinding, is not eligible, as is purchasing or leasing land. Per head limits are applied to the total combined amount of extraordinary expenses that can be used in calculating payment. That is, the total combined 
uh, value of extraordinary uh, expenses used in calculating your payment is capped at $133.33 per head for beef and dairy cattle, bison, elk, and horses for PMU. For sheep and goats, the cap is $26.66 per head. How do you declare your extraordinary expenses? Well, on the form for your declaration of extraordinary expenses, you'll give us five numbers. That is, you'll give us a total dollar value for the different types of expenses. So for accessing extra acres, you'll put in the total value of all the extra pasture and graze in the cropland rented. For harvesting extra acres, you'll put in the total dollar value combined for all of the custom harvesting fees plus the value of the fuel and paid labor for using your own equipment. For water sourcing, it is similar. You'll put in the total dollar value combined for all the custom fees for trucking water, pumping water, and the use of your own fuel and labor and paid labor to do the same. For hauling feed that you produce, it's a little more uh, broken down. You give us a total dollar value for the fuel and paid labor for moving the feed yourself, and the total dollar value for the uh, value uh, cost of the custom charges for moving your feed. When you're looking at the fuel and paid labor for using your own equipment, there are no prescribed rates. If you want to have a guideline, you can visit and look at our farm machinery guide on our website. However, we do not prescribe that. You do not have to use a set rate. You are the person with the invoices. You are the person who knows the type of equipment you used, where it was used, the time required, and the acres covered. So it is your declaration, uh, not a preset guide that we have for determining uh, what the value is. Now there are rates, and this is the one case when it comes to transportation, and this will mostly apply to the custom haul feed, where you cannot declare a value greater than what we would have based on our ton kilometer rates that the program provides for hauling purchased feed. But once you've entered these five numbers, what we do as a program is we add them all up to get a grand total for the total extraordinary expenses claimed, and that is the value of expenses included in determining program payments. Over the life of the program, you can make one submission of ex uh, extraordinary expenses. So you can ex submit the declaration form once. When you submit it, however, there is no requirement, that is no requirement for you to submit invoices and proof of payment for the expenses being claimed. However, you should keep this documentation on file in case it happens to be uh, requested by the program administrator. You can ex submit your declaration of ex extraordinary expenses alone or along with other program claims. If this is the first time you've ever applied to the program, you should also submit a declaration of your eligible breeding animals. This is what tells us your number of breeding heads so that we can apply uh, the per head caps in the extraordinary expenses claimed. However, if you've already uh, are in the program, there is no need for you to submit this declaration, this breeding animal declaration, a second time. If you visit our website, you can get more information and resources on the Egg Recovery Drought Assistance Program, including the recent addition of extraordinary expenses. These include an updated guide, your extraordinary expense declaration form, as well as infographics that have been updated to include extraordinary expenses.
everybody was able to uh, get some lunch and have a health break. I think I just scarfed down a sub quicker than I probably ever have, but uh, definitely well worth it. So welcome back again uh, to our to MBP's 43rd Annual General Meeting. In case you're just joining us now, I'm Carson Callum, General Manager of MBP. Once again, I'd like to thank you all for joining us and really hope, really appreciate you taking the time away uh, you know, from the up and down weather we've been having to, to join us in this, this alternate format than we originally intended. So hopefully we don't have more technical glitches this afternoon and that things can continue to run smoothly. I'll just start by acknowledging that we operate throughout Manitoba, which is located on the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, Cree, OJ Cree, Dakota, Dene, and Métis, Métis peoples. Our office in Winnipeg is located on Treaty 1 territory in the homeland of the Métis Nation. Our work extends throughout Treaties 2, 3, 4, and 5. In your program, you'll see the agenda for the business portion of the agenda, which includes proposed amendments to our administrative bylaws and a resolutions debate. There will also be presentations from Casey Vanderplug with the National Cattle Feeders Association and the keynote presentation being Quick Dick, Del Del Quick Dick McDick or Dixon Delorme um, to close off the day. I'd like to touch on a few procedural matters of the meeting. Each meeting delegate shall be responsible for the, their audio and internet connections. No action shall be invalidated on the grounds that the loss of or poor quality of an individual's connection prevented their participation in the meeting. In terms of the, of the debate, <clears throat> or if you have a question, raise your hand using the, that function you know, within Zoom and wait, for, wait to speak until you've been recognized and unmuted by the chair. State your name and your district number or organization when you speak. Microphones should be muted, muted throughout the afternoon when not speaking to limit any background noise. No electronic recording devices is permitted during the proceedings unless approved in advance. So in terms of voting, for motions throughout the AGM, we'll be using the polling function on Zoom. Note that certain motions may call for the question in reverse. Um, actually, scratch that. We are, we're, we've confirmed we're gonna go through uh, the polling function. Um, so there won't be any recurse questions unless we, there's an issue with, uh, with the polling function itself. Question will arise on your screen uh, and you can choose either in favor or opposed. We also have a text in option if that works better for you. I'm gonna put the, the text in the chat right now at, and then I'll say it out loud just for all to know. Okay, so if you wanna text that number and please state your name, hometown and your voting decision. So whether it's in favor or opposed. Voting is based on the honor system and is for eligible MVP members only. Please no double voting. So don't vote in the poll and in text. Results on motion will be announced through the chair. Votes on proposed administration bylaws and resolutions debate will be tallied and reported back to the parliamentarian and the results announced. The rules contained in the current edition of Robert Rules of Order newly revised shall govern in all cases to which they are applicable and where they are not inconsistent with MBP's bylaws. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first presentation. So we're pleased to have a greeting uh, provided to us from the Honorable Mary Clovey Bow, Minister of Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada uh, and Member of Parliament uh, for Compton, St Stansted, Quebec, on behalf of her department and the federal government. Her complete biography is included in your AGM program. So now I'm going to share my screen and play the, the greeting uh, from, from Minister Bebo. Melissa, if you can give me a thumbs up, you can see that. And then once you hear sound.
Manitoba Beef Producers and to producers from across the province. I want to thank you for everything you do to strengthen our industry's viability, improve prosperity, and ensure a sustainable future for the beef industry in Manitoba. I also want to recognize you all for your resilience and dedication in the face of a global pandemic and a devastating drought. Last summer, I was able to see the impacts of the drought during our visit to the Interlake region. Thank you to Mike Duguid for welcoming me to Camp Morton Beef Farm, along with Tyler and the team. I wanted to see with my own eyes the impacts of the drought, not just this year, but over the past several years. While the recent moisture has been welcomed, I know the feed situation remains serious for producers and will remain challenging going forward. I'm pleased to see that you will take time today to discuss mental health. I've spoken with many producers who are facing challenges from the pandemic to childcare, to labor shortages, to supply chain disruptions, to weather disasters, to trade barriers, to name just a few. Mental health and wellness need to be part of the conversation. It's important to reach out for the many resources available. In the face of these challenges, many Manitoba farmers needed their governments to act fast, and we did. In a matter of weeks, we were able to deliver urgent relief to cattle producers under the Federal Provincial Agri-Recovery Framework. Our shared investment of up to $155 million is helping producers purchase and test the feed for livestock to maintain their breeding herds and transport feed from distant locations. Last week, in response to the industry, Minister Johnson and I announced that we are adding more eligible expenses that producers are facing to getting feed, water, and pasture for their animals. These extra costs include rental of additional crop or pasture, temporary fencing for extra grazing, and harvesting more land. The improvements to the program will help producers rebuild their herds and move forward through this challenging period. We also partnered with the province to change the crop insurance program so that grain producers could offer their damaged crops for animal feed and still be eligible for crop insurance payments. We got more money into the pockets of farmers through larger advance payments under the Agri-Stability Program. And we partnered with the Canadian Federation of Agriculture to connect Eastern and Western producers through the Hay West program, supported by a $4 million federal investment to cover transportation costs. While these measures are helping producers through the crisis, the drought was a stark reminder that farmers and ranchers are on the front lines of climate change. Manitoba cattle producers already play a significant role in meeting our sustainability goals from carbon storage to preservation of wildlife and native forages. So now is the time to double down, to improve our resilience to the effects of climate change. Our consumers and trading partners are demanding sustainable food and Manitoba beef producers can deliver. That's why the government of Canada has launched over half a billion dollars in new programming to help farmers adopt sustainable practices and clean technologies. We are now rolling out the first wave of our Agricultural Clean Technology Program. In Manitoba, we've already invested over $4 million to help farmers with on-farm projects, including biomass boilers for grain dryers and precision agriculture technology. And there's more to come. Manitoba producers are also eligible for the proceeds from carbon pricing through refundable tax credits for the 2021 tax year. These could help them to invest in clean technologies on the farm. Looking ahead, we are moving forward on your key priorities for 2022. On business risk management programs, we have delivered on direction from producers to eliminate the reference margin limit, which will put up to $95 million back into their pockets. We want to move forward with the provinces on increasing the compensation rate to 80%. And for the longer term, ministers have agreed to make the programs more timely, equitable, and easy to understand while supporting the competitiveness and sustainability of the sector. Over the coming months, 
Minister Johnson and our colleagues across the country will be working together to shape the next five-year policy framework for agriculture starting in 2023. Minister Johnson and I met during our tour of the Interlake, and we had a good meeting last week to move forward on the priorities of Manitoba producers. Building on the achievements of our shared investments under the Canadian Agricultural Partnership in Manitoba, we will work to target investments under the new framework to key priorities for agriculture in Manitoba. I encourage you to engage in this process. So together, we can build a sector that is sustainable environmentally, economically, and socially. I wish you all a productive meeting and a successful season 2022. Great, <clears throat> and I apologies, folks, for the for the volume. If it was a little down, I have to control it on my computer, and then I when I crank it up, it darn near blows my ear, eardrums out. So uh, hopefully, it was a little better later on here. Excellent. Well, thank you to to Minister Bebo for that you know excellent greeting. Uh, moving on on the agenda now, we're pleased to have greetings from the Honorable Derek Johnson, Minister of Agriculture and a member of the Legislative Assembly for Interlake Gimli <clears throat> on behalf of his department and the provincial government. Minister Johnson uh, was elected as MLA in his constituency in 2000, April 2006 and re-elected in the new constituency of Interlake Gimli in September 2009. A proud resident of the Inner Lake with farming roots, Derek is eager to put his experience in business and municipal government to work for the people of the Inner Lake Gimli as their MLA and their Minister of Agriculture. Derek served as a councillor for the RM of St. Laurent from 2010 to 2014. During his term on council, his responsibilities included finance, drainage, and emergency services. He also served on the board for the West Inner Lake Planning District. Derek earned a reputation as a positive, results-driven leader through his dedication to the RM during the unprecedented flood of 2011. For eight years prior, Derek was a financial advisor serving area residents and assistant branch manager for the local financial institution. Derek was born and raised in Oak Point, where his family has resided for the past four generations. Derek now lives on the shores of Lake Manitoba with his wife, Tara, and two adult children, and has two adult children. So Derek, I believe you are here. Oh, he was here <laughs> and uh, he may have fell off. We'll have to find you in the list here again, Minister. And Minister, if you are there or if any of your, your team have you on, um, it, it is helpful to unmute your video because I think you have that ability. And then we can uh, direct you to unmute. Peace disappeared on us. I don't know if Diane riding's on like she was supposed to be. This could be the time for her to hum her elevator music. Sure, Melissa, you got an appropriate dad joke to tell while we wait. <laughs> Most of them aren't appropriate, right? Okay, we'll give us a minute here. We are ahead of schedule, so I'm wondering if uh, we just need to hold off and wait for Minister Johnson to join us.
we are actually running a bit ahead of schedule. So he was, he is scheduled to come on at 1.25. Uh, so he's going to try to jump on early. I just uh, spoke to his assistant. So sure he's uh, got a few things to, to look at today. I do see that Melissa has graced us with at least one wonderful joke. And the rebuttal by Arvid is impressive as well. There he is. Good afternoon, Minister. I believe uh, you're there and I'll get you to unmute. Sorry sorry to be ahead of schedule for you here. It's, uh, <laughs> That's but thank okay. you for joining I'm, us. <laughs> I'm glad you got a hold of, uh, of, of them. And uh, yeah, I don't mind accommodating your schedule. Uh, just, just got out of a meeting, so perfect timing. Okay. Excellent. Well, you can take the greeting away. I've already uh, read your bio um, and uh, we're good to go. Okay, perfect. Well, thank you for this opportunity to join you today and, and uh, have you uh, have me on your 43rd, I guess now, annual meeting and uh, on behalf of the province and of course my department and uh, my colleagues from the legislature, thank you for the invite. So as a new minister to the department, um, I'm, I'm looking forward to working with uh, with everyone here and all of you to advance the beef sector in our province. And um, obviously, this uh, the beef sector is is essential to Manitoba's uh, agriculture landscape and, quite frankly, our our economy as a province. In uh, 2020, Manitoba sold over 450,000 head and reported uh, $621 million in cash receipts for cattle and calves. 2021, of course, was a challenging year for the beef sector due to the uh, drought conditions. And for some areas of the province, producers have, be, have seen uh, repeated years of drier conditions. And as a result, the uh, drought uh, brought severe impacts. So as you're aware, uh, our government and the federal government announced um, uh, three agri recovery drought assistance programs. And so on August um, 31st, 2021, the government announced the first, uh, the first two programs and, and you're well aware of them, but uh, it's livestock feed and uh, transportation drought assistance program and then also the livestock transportation drought um, uh, program, assistance program. So the intent of the programs is to assist livestock producers with uh, the cost of purchasing feed, transporting feed to the livestock and or transporting the livestock to the feed, whatever the pro producer uh, chose. So then on uh, November 30th, we announced that the uh, the herd management drought assistance program to uh, uh, it was intended to help livestock producers offset costs associated with replacing uh, their breeding animals that they've called due to the shortage of feed. So in designing this uh, program, um, my department responded to concerns from producers and and our stakeholders and streamlined the process by uh, incorporating a, a declaration based application. And um, this process, I think, is, is welcome. And my department continues to work closely with the industry to monitor, uh, adapt, and respond to make amendments to these programs and to support producers in Manitoba. So in late uh, January 2022, our government and the federal government announced the expansion of eligible feeds, uh, the, expanding the list and the addition of extraordinary expenses for livestock feed and transportation drought assistance program. So our government recognizes that uh, producers need additional help with other extraordinary expenses to recover from the 2021 drought. So the expansion of the livestock feed and transportation drought assistance program will, it, it'll help cover some of those extraordinary expenses um, livestock producers incurred and 
and accessing the feed or the water or, or uh, pasture due to the drought. So you can submit a claim for those expenses that um, many of you incurred in order to get the feed that you needed to maintain your herds over, uh, over the winter. So uh, while you may not have had feed purchases, but still had extraordinary costs, such as renting extra pasture or harvesting extra acres for feed or hauling water uh, because of the drought, you can submit your extraordinary expenses in a declaration. So this um, declaration on its own can trigger a payment. So when combined with um, feed invoices uh, or you know, many more producers will be eligible for the maximum payment. So the livestock uh, feed and transportation drought assistance program has uh, already uh, processed nearly 1300 claims as of this morning. And we're obviously accepting new claims on an ongoing basis until the scheduled deadline of um, April 15th. 2022. But today, I am pleased to announce that uh, MASC's lending limits are being increased effective April 1st to ensure they remain relevant to producers and support the sustainability um, development and diversification of agriculture and the, uh, and the rural economy in Manitoba. So the limit for direct loans will increase to uh, four and a quarter, $4.25 million from three and a half to reflect increase in land values and other operating costs. Direct loans can be utilized to purchase agriculture land, um, buildings, agriculture equipment, breeding livestock, and uh, also quota for supply ma managed commodities, uh, construction or renovation of farm buildings, um, greenhouse and nurseries, uh, for example. Uh, or you can consolidate and refinance your, your debts and, um, and financing some of your operating expenses. So the stalker loans provide uh, producers with short-term financing to, uh, to purchase replacement heifers and feeder cattle, um, or they can be used as a cash advance for producers who choose to retain their own feeder animals. So uh, the limit for the stalker loans as well will increase uh, to uh, three quarters of a million from 500,000. Um, and it will provide an excellent tool to assist producers in rebuilding their herd. So similarly, the individual borrowing limit through the uh, Manitoba Livestock Association Loan Guarantees Program will also be increasing to $750,000. So the program encourages um, Feeding cattle in Manitoba, which provides uh, several economic spin-offs for the province, and to ensure associations remain strong, the maximum borrowing limit per association will also increase to twelve million dollars, and that'll help uh, help accommodate additional individual borrowing. So, in closing, my department recognizes how much uh, all of you, your, all of our producers, uh, care deeply about their livestock. And these programs will help towards um, the recovery and ongoing sustainability and, and growth of our beef sector. So thank you again for this opportunity to be here today. And thank you on behalf of the department and the, uh, myself, the Minister of Agriculture and all my colleagues here at the legislature. Wonderful. Well, thank you very much, Minister, for, for that greetings and we, we look forward to working with you on many files moving forward that uh, impact the beef sector here in the province. Thank you for your time. Yep. Okay. I now call on our president, Tyler Fulton, to take care of a couple matters. So Tyler, if you wanna move us forward in the agenda, we're good to go. I guess I gotta unmute you, eh? Perfect. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Carson. And uh, thank you, of course, to uh, the two ministers, Minister Bibo and Minister uh, Johnson. Um, I can say that uh, over the course of the last year, um, I can feel very confident and proud about uh, the relationship that we've had with those 
two ministers, we've worked very closely uh, with them to uh, to deal with the conditions of the drought. Um, and so uh, it's uh, it was really nice to get some um, some direct uh, uh, connection to them here in, at our uh, meeting. So um, I'm just following the agenda here. Let's see what we got. I, I guess, uh, first off, thanks everybody for uh, joining the meeting today. Um, and thank you, uh, Nancy and the whole um, AGM uh, committee uh, for uh, putting this uh, agenda together and, and uh, preparing everything. Um, we hope to be doing the uh, in-person meetings, as Carson has said earlier, uh, again, um, very soon, um, but it just wasn't in the cards for, uh, for this year. Um, <clears throat> so first off, I guess I'd like to, um, I'd like to see a motion uh, to adopt the agenda of the business portion of the meeting. Um, can I get a mover, uh, please, for that motion? I see Melissa and Melissa Atchison and a seconder, please. Can I get a seconder for that motion? I see uh, Alfred, actually. Um, and so uh, it is moved and seconded, and the agenda uh, should be uh, so adopted. I, I'll, I'll, we're gonna we're gonna test the poll here, Tyler. Okay, that's yeah. That's perfect. Those yep, in so. favor, yeah. Those in favor, go ahead and vote now when the poll comes up on your screen, as well as those opposed. Looks like it's it's carried, Tyler. Awesome, thank you so much. Uh, so the affirmative has it, uh, and we're uh, going to move on. Um, I guess the next uh, next thing here <clears throat> in your delegate package um, are the minutes for the forty second um, annual meeting uh, that we had last February. Um, and uh, on the advice of our parliamentarian, um, Manitoba Beef Producers Board of Directors reviewed the, the minutes and at our March 2021 meeting actually approved them um, while they were all fresh in our minds. Um, so rather than waiting a full year. So we don't need to uh, approve the minutes from the last AGM as the board has already done so. Um, on behalf of Manitoba Beef Producers Board of Directors, I would uh, like to officially call the business portion of the meeting uh, to order. Um, and I will start into my uh, president's uh, report. <clears throat> so my full report is actually distributed in the annual report uh, that was actually in both the cattle country and I think connected in the package that was uh, provided upon registration of, for the, uh, the AGM. 2021 was obviously a, a challenging year um, for the beef industry in, uh, in Manitoba. And uh, the Manitoba Beef Producer Directors and staff uh, were very busy on working on different issues. Countless hours were spent advocating for program, programs and services to help producers deal with the challenges caused by the devastating drought conditions. There was extensive outreach to federal and provincial officials as I just referred to earlier, um, about the measures that were needed for producers. And we sincerely thank Ministers Bibo and Johnson and other elected officials uh, for visiting Manitoba farms uh, to see the situation firsthand. Uh, also uh, included in that obviously was the previous ministers, um, Minister Peterson and Minister Eichler. Minister Peterson got the ball rolling in the spring and uh, Minister Eichler moved us through that, that core uh, drought period. Um, in the summer, uh, important agri-recovery programs were announced related to feed and transportation, as well as a herd management program to help producers rebuild the, uh, the breeding herd. Thereafter, Manitoba beef producers continued to ask for more kinds of extraordinary expenses to be made eligible for coverage. This, 
This included costs such as hauling water, accessing added uh, crop and or pasture acres, temporary fencing for supplemental grazing, harvesting extra acres, or hauling self-produced feed from distant locations. Manitoba beef producers thanks both levels of government for listening to those concerns and for making those valuable changes uh, that were announced just, uh, I think, about 10 days ago. Making business risk management programs like AgriStability more responsive was another priority, and that was earlier in the year uh, we saw some, some changes there. The removal of the reference margin limit uh, should make the program more equitable and bankable for our sector. Our changes are, uh, other changes are being sought to BRM programs to help level the playing field between livestock and cropping sectors. There was ongoing work uh, on the agricultural crown lands um, as well. Uh, Manitoba Beef Producers has repeatedly called for a five-year transition to rental rate increases, um, for unit transfers to be reinstated, and for transparent, uh, a transparent system for valuing improvements in that auction process. And these are things, uh, among others, uh, that we advocated for. Uh, I'm, I have no doubt uh, that we will continue these discussions uh, in the coming year and uh, have already engaged in discussions with, uh, with the minister, uh, the new minister about, uh, about this issue. The livestock predation prevention pilot project is underway. Uh, thanks to the provincial government and other organizations who are uh, working on, uh, on this important initiative. Um, and uh, thanks also to producers who are uh, testing various risk mitigation uh, practices. Looking ahead, uh, there's still some uncertainty around things like the pandemic and about whether cool will be reenacted um, and, you know, and the risk of any trade action for that matter. Um, but at the same time, I'm optimistic, um, you know, especially especially after hearing uh, Brian Perilat's uh, outlook and when pressed about what the upside potential could possibly be for the feeder market here in the summer or in the uh, fall, um, you heard it here, I think he said 310. Um, so let's be honest, that's, uh, that's an optimistic view and I think the fundamentals definitely support a higher market, but um, there's, there's good reason for optimism, I think. There's strong demand for our uh, safe and high quality beef products. There's a growing recognition of the valuable ecosystem services that's uh, provided by beef production in Manitoba, especially as part of the climate change discussions. And so I encourage you to talk about your experiences in raising beef and caring for the environment with anyone who asks for more information. In closing, I'd like to thank uh, my wife and family, Durrell, and my kids, Evan and May, uh, for their support during uh, my time away from our uh, from uh, from our farm. Um, I have to also mention um, my uh, my parents, David and Verna Fulton, for picking up some of the, some of the slack, and uh, and my uh, my hired guys uh, that are definitely farm partners for sure. Um, Zach and Gerard just uh, really rely on that whole team to, uh, to be able to do um, the extra work that's required in particular over this past year. And I also wanna say thank you uh, to the directors, uh, to my fellow directors um, with whom I serve. Uh, there is also a, a dedicated staff uh, of uh, on Manitoba beef producers, Carson, Marine, uh, then our new hire, Jennifer, and of course, David. Um, those are all the, the core staff members in the office. And uh, man, you guys have put in a ton of time and effort over the course of the last year in particular. Um, and, and really proud of the work that, that, uh, that you have done. So finally, I thank you all. Uh, uh, I thank all the members um, for the, your ideas and, and feedback. Um, this is very important as, uh, as we advocate um, on your behalf. If anyone has any other questions, I'd be ple pleased to answer them. 
Um, and if not, I will uh, now turn the chair back over to Carson. Thanks. Thanks, Tyler. Um, I'll just wait and see if there's any hand raises or questions in the chat function. Okay, I'm well, not seeing any, so I think we'll we'll continue on on the agenda then. And I'll get right into the report from the general manager. So no surprise to anyone and what we've referenced many times, many times 2021 was uh, was challenging, it posed many challenges and, and opportunities. I'm going to cover a few highlights today. And I will refer to you to the full annual report for more details on all the things that uh, MVP was involved in over the last uh, last year. As Tyler mentioned, drought was the main focus of MVP and topic on producers' minds in 2021. You all know how it started. Poor spring runoff, little soil moisture. Some dugouts were close to dry before cattle even went out, went out to pasture. And really that's why MVP started our advocacy work uh, as it relates to drought really early, initially focusing on water availability, because that was the, the key issue um, with, without that spring runoff. We're pleased that uh, Manitoba Agriculture and Resource Development at the time opened up BMP 503 to allow producers to develop other sources of water for their livestock. But once we got further in the season, it was clear that rains weren't weren't going to come in a sufficient amount to recharge pastures and improve crop and hay growth. So MBP shifted its focus from water to feed availability, which is becoming a major issue, which had become a major issue all across Western Canada and Northwest Ontario. Industry worked together to address some of the short-term challenges, such as changes to uh, MASC's programming to encourage grain producers to convert damaged or poor crops to feed options for cattle also triggering the hay disaster benefit for those with forage policies. Advocacy efforts were done on the provincial and federal level in collaboration with the Canadian Cattlemen's Association and our counterparts in various provincial and national cattle groups and other uh, provincial industry groups such as Keystone Agriculture Producers and Manitoba Forage and Grasslands. This advocacy effort such as hosting the Agriculture and Agri-Food Minister Mary Colby Bow and other respected officials from provincial and federal governments to help bring the issue to front of mind resulted in a substantial amount of dollars being committed to the Agri recovery framework, which is really a disaster assistance framework for programs to be developed under. MVP sought a two stage approach. One was a per head payment to assist in the, in the extraordinary costs associated with maintaining a producer's herd. And the second was a program to support producers for them to su have support to rebuild to pre drought levels. MVP was pleased to see that there was a multi-stage program announced and has continued to seek adjustments to the current program to make it responsive to producers and the expenses that they incurred. I strongly encourage the, for producers to look at the programs before the deadline uh, for applications is in, especially on the feed assistance program and consider the herd rebuild as some of the recent changes for expansion of eligibility uh, should provide benefit. Many of the support programs for the ag sector come from the Canadian Agriculture Partnership, which ends on March 2023. MBP has been taking part in many consultations for the next policy framework, which will, will support future program funding streams. When we look ahead to new government policies, climate change is going to be a common theme in many government departments. And there'll be a big focus going forward on efforts to reduce its impact in the agriculture sector. The beef industry has the opportunity to be a major champion in this area, given the ecosystem services it provides while producing a high quality product. I believe the environmental benefits beef production provides are key to leveling the playing field between beef and other commodities. For example, if a producer can see a financial return for maintaining grassland habitats, we may see a slowdown in conversion of some of these native grasslands to commodity producing grain land. Maintaining precious habitats have many societal benefits as well. And I see this as a major opportunity for the beef industry moving forward. Protein is a major focus of Manitoba agriculture. Over the year, I've been involved in multiple engagement with the protein strategy, recommending what would be beneficial to the beef sector, such as recognition, recognition of those ecosystem goods and services. 
I cannot look back on 2021 without commenting on COVID-19 pandemic's impact and its continued impacts. It still impacts how we're able to conduct business and advance files. However, the team has still done a great job in accomplishing a great deal with the hand we were dealt. I want to thank the board uh, for their phenomenal effort and dedication to the industry during a difficult time, even when these difficult times were hitting their own operations just as hard as all our members. Thank you, Tyler Fulton, for your leadership as we navigated through the year. I know I owe you a beverage or two personally for all you did. I thank the dedicating and hardworking team at MBP with whom I have the privilege to work with, and that includes Marine Cousins, David Halton, Jennifer Patrick, Deb Walger, and Ray Bittner. On a personal front, it was a busy year in the Callum House. We welcomed a second boy to our family, uh, Sullivan. His big brother Cohen has had a has been great help for, for mom and dad during this transition from one child to two, which is as busy as they say, which many of you will know. They've been very supportive of me as I worked in the work through the drought, drought crisis and away, it was away for home, from home for many of these efforts and, the, and many other files throughout 2021. As I look forward to the 2022 growing season, I hope we have sufficient moisture so we aren't in a crisis situation again and allow MBP to refocus on many of our other files, such as agricultural ground lands, supply chain issues and climate. And finally, I thank, I wanna say thanks to all the members uh, for the support, uh, feedback and support of our efforts throughout the year and all the best to you in 2021, happy or 2022, happy to answer any questions you might have. I see there's a question here um, within the chat. Is MVP doing any lobbying to support provincially inspected on farm kill beef animals like Alberta and any progress on the matter? Uh, it's something we've been engaging with with the department uh, with uh, Brandon to see if there's any potential for changes similar to what Alberta did to allow for a bit of you know, expanded market for producers. So it's something that we have been working on. No progress to date. Um, with the changes happening relatively recent in Alberta and in other jurisdictions. And we hope to see some, uh, some movement on that file. Any other questions for my report? Okay, I'm not seeing any pop up quite yet. So we will continue on on the agenda. So I will now call on Mark Good. MBP Treasurer, District 12 Director, and Chair of the Finance Committee to review MBP's finances from the 2020-2021 fiscal year. A copy of MBP's fi audited financial statements are included in your delegate package or that link that was provided to you from, from Eventbrite where you registered, and there'll be time at the end for questions. So Mark, I'm going to ask you to unmute, and then I'm going to share the screen, and, and we'll advance the slides for you. Perfect. I think we can hear you, Mark. Thank you, Carson. And I will uh, share this. And as always, I just need a, th a thumbs up that this is viewable. Okay. Okay. Um, where do your checkoff dollars go? Uh, when cattle are marketed in Canada, a small portion of every sale is collected as checkoff or levy. Here in Manitoba, the checkoff is $3 per head. Manitoba beef producers use these funds to carry out specific activities related to advocacy, research, promotion, uh, public trust, and more. When provincial checkoff funds, with, with provincial checkoff funds, we also pay a membership to two national associations the Canadian Cattle Association and the National Cattle Feeders Association to ensure we have a voice in various federal files and initiatives. The $2.50 head per head national checkoff funds three main areas of work on a national scale, Canada Beef, Canadian Cattle Research Cattle Council and the Public and Stakeholder Engagement Initiative. 
The public and stakeholder engagements work is very important, important for our industry moving forward as it has a strong focus on public trust related to the beef sector. Uh, slide three. Um, financial year, year in review. As Carson mentioned, you have a copy of Myers Norris Pennies audited financials in your meeting package. Myers Norris Pennies Penny has completed their audit audit of Manitoba beef producers financial statement for 2020-2021. No material concerns were found by the auditors. We ended the fiscal year with an excess of revenue over expenses of $296,128. Revenue, this slide shows where most of our revenue is generated, which is through checkoff funds. The middle column shows the number of cattle marketed in 2020, 2021. It is very close to the five-year average, a portion of money collected is returned to producers as refunds. We also pay dealer fees to those that collect checkoff on Manitoba beef producers behalf. This leads to the net checkoff in the, in the table on your screen. Expenses. Uh, this slide demonstrates where the bulk of our expenses come from. Board meetings and director expenses, to be an effective organization, directors need to meet, share their opinions, and the concerns of the, produce, the producers in their districts. These expenses were down substantially due to the impact of the pandemic being able to safely meet. CCA fees, we pay Canadian Cattlemen's Association membership fees to ensure we take part in many federal-based files, other memberships, one example is the National Cattle Feeders Association, staff expenses, office and rent. These are more of those fixed expenses, salaries and benefits. Expenses for 2020, 2021 were down due, some, due to some role vacancies and staff changes. The organization needs change over time. This influences the roles required to be an effective team. Are there any questions? Um, I'm not seeing any, any Carson. Um, I guess I'll move on. Yeah, I'm not seeing any hands raised or any in the chat at this point, um, but I think you can move on to the auditor motion. Okay. If there are no, no further questions, uh, Manitoba Beef Producers Board of Directors has recommended that Myers Norris Penny be appointed as Manitoba Beef Producers Auditor for the upcoming fiscal year. I would like to make the following motion. Uh, to appoint Myers Norris Penny as Manitoba Beef Producers Financial Auditor for the 2021-2022 fiscal year. May I have a seconder for this motion? Looks like Arvid. Arvid not that would be the the seconder for that. Okay, so Arvid uh, not that from District 11 has seconded the motion. Um, it is moved and seconded that Myers Norris Penny be appointed as Manitoba Beef Producers Financial Auditor for the 2021-2022 fiscal year. Is there any debate? And Robert, I see you have your hand up. Do you have a question or is it, were you moving? I was moving. Okay. No, thanks, Robert. I'm just going to lower your hand then. Okay. I'm not seeing any, any comments or debate made, so I will launch the poll similar to our adoption of the agenda and uh, attendees can vote in favor or opposed. So 
So those that are in favor can vote now. Those opposed can vote now. It looks like uh, that is passed. Okay, the motion is passed. Uh, thank you. That completes the financial update. I will turn things back to Carson. Excellent. Thanks, Mark. You're welcome. For running us. Okay. So. We're going to get into the next section of the agenda what now, which is review and approval of proposed bylaw amendments by MCPA bylaw number 189, which is our administrative bylaw. So as part of the continued review of our administrative bylaw, the board of directors of the Manitoba Cattle Producers Association, who operate as Manitoba beef producers, is proposing to membership a number of amendments to help modernize our bylaws. The proposed amendments are in your program and as a separate attachment in your delegate package. Joining us virtually today to assist with the discussion on the proposed bylaw changes, as well as the resolution section is Vera Chernecki, registered parliamentarian. As a parliamentarian, she uses her skills to assist individuals and organizations to have better meetings using Robert's Rules of Order, newly revised. Vera brings her many years of experience as past president of a, an 11,000 member provincial organization, having chaired large conventions, conventions, committees, and boards. We are pleased to have her with us today. As a reminder, voting on the proposed bylaw amendments and resolutions up for debate is restricted to beef producers who are members in accordance with the Manitoba Cattle Producers Association's administrative bylaw. As per section 11B of the bylaw, membership refers to every person who is determined by the board of directors to actively engage in raising cattle in Manitoba and who pays fees to the association in a manner and in the amount imposed by sellers of cattle pursuant to regulations made by the board of directors from time to time. What does this mean? It means that if you've requested a refund in the last 12 months and you've and not paid all fees to the association as set out by the regulation, you are not a member in good standing. Voting on resolutions as well as proposed amendments to the organization's administrative bylaws will take place electronically, as I referenced before, using the polling system. Before turning the discussion over to propose for the proposed administration bylaw changes, I'd like to give you a high level overview of what is being considered. So please reserve, refer to your either your program, uh, which is immediately following the bio section or to a separate administration bylaw document in your delegate package. Matters for consideration as part of the proposed amendments include the addition of a provision allowing one additional term extension for a director. So you can see election of directors of the association, section 7.6 on page 10 and 7.14 on page 11. The addition of an external appointment provision See special committees, section 11.11 on page 16, and the realignment of certain districts to municipal amalgamations in recent years, and the associated update of certain local government, municipality, and rural municipality names listed in the 14 districts as a result of said amalgamations. You can see the appendix A, which is covered over pages 20 to 23. I will now pass the chair over to Ms. Tavira. Thank you. I'll have to probably unmute you. You should see a prompt to say that, uh, Vera. Okay, can you hear me now? You Thank, you, Car Thank you, Carson, and uh, hello to everybody. I'm new to the Beef Producers uh, Association or in Manitoba Beef Producers, but uh, I um, had a sister and brother-in-law who owned a huge cattle ranch uh, 
um, they, that they sold about 20 years ago. So um, I know that they were quite involved with the association. And I come from a farming, farming background, so certainly can understand all the problems that have been occurring in this last year for sure. So uh, Carson has mentioned the voting procedure. I don't know if I need to go over it, we'll, but we'll be using the polling function. Uh, questions will arise on your um, screen and you'll be able to choose either in favor and opposed, which you've done in other, in the other votes. And there's the text option. Uh, and Carson has put that number in the chat function too. Um, Again, voting is based on the uh, honor system and uh, no double voting, please. And results will be announced by the, front, by the chair. Uh, so voting votes on the proposed administration bylaw changes and the res resolutions debate will be tallied and then reported back. So I need a mover right now for a motion that's coming forward from the Manitoba Beef Producers Board to commence the discussion about the proposed amendments. Uh, it's a motion, it'll be a motion coming from the board and so we only need a mover, a seconder is not required. So is there a mover for the uh, proposed amendment? Do we have a mover? Okay, Arvid, uh, you're making the motion. Uh, and so uh, I'll just mention what it is. It's, uh, it is moved, moved to amend the Manitoba Cattle Producers Association Administration Bylaw Number 1 slash 89 by repealing the existing version dated February 11th, 2021, and replacing it with the Manitoba Cattle Producers Association Administrator, Administration Bylaw Number 1 slash 22 dated February 10th, 2022, attached here to a Schedule A. And Carson has provided an overview of the proposed changes, so I'm not going to go through them. And you've had them uh, circulated to you for uh, quite a time, a while. So is there any debate on the proposed amendments? If there is, raise your hand, or I think the, uh, you can put your questions in the chat box. All right, there's a hand there. Uh, could you please uh, state your name and state your question? I guess you have to unmute. Hi, I'm Robert Metner from District 11. And I'm opposed to the part of the bylaw to extend the extra term for the directors. I have been a had been a member, a director of the uh, board for four years, and in that time, I seen nine changes. And every time we had a change, we brought new perspective to the to the board, which I figured would be lacking if that is the past. So I'm opposed to that part of it. All right. Are, are we voting on the whole thing, or is it just separate pieces at a time? We're, we can we can do the pieces. Uh, you can do the pieces at a time, and and there are certain pieces. So if you wanted to propose an amendment, for example, uh, or what you're saying is you're you're opposed to the, what we what is being proposed uh, to extend the term. You want to leave it as as is, right? So that yes. Okay. Well, that's noted. Then uh, is there any other debate? Anyone else want to speak in favor of the uh, proposed amendment? You can uh, put your hand down now, Arvid, please. No further questions? Carson, there's nothing that you can see, is there? No, I'm not seeing any hands raised or any, uh, okay. either in the chat or to uh, debate okay. those comments. So, so the question is on the motion to amend the bylaw as I had just read and that you have before you. Uh, 
um, a 60 percent vote to amend the bylaws required so uh, we'll have to see there are 75 participants right now i guess i don't know if that's carson is that the number we would take and take 50 percent of that no not all these oh. these participants here are members in good standing but we do have quorum after my my tally so okay so you you'll you'll know how many actually voted yeah and, and how many were opposed and then we have to have 60 percent in favor so all right so those in favor vote now can we have the poll those opposed vote now too please We also have the, as a reminder for folks who aren't able to use the poll function, we have the text line. I'll repeat that number that you can text your your vote, whether in favor or opposed to at 1204-558-4502. That's 204-558-4502. I'm just gonna wait for some of those to come in, Vera. And uh, okay. we'll, we'll move on, or I'll, I'll let you know the results of the poll in a second here. All right, because I can't see that. And I'll just clarify uh, with the, those attending. Um, some of, some folks are industry representatives, so they're not actual you know cattle producers that are eligible to vote. Mm -hmm. Just going to give it a little more time just to confirm. So, uh, Vera, the the affirmative looks to have it with eighty two percent in favor. All right. So, the affirmative. Uh, there are more than sixty percent in the affirmative, and the motion is adopted. Thank you, everybody. And I'll now turn the um, proceedings back over to Carson. Okay. Thank you very much. So I'm now gonna move on to the introduction and ratification of the incoming board of directors, as you'll see on the agenda. So during the fall of 2021 district meetings, there were director openings in district four and 14 due to Kevin Dudridge and Jim Buchanan opting not to seek not to seek re-election following the completion of their first two-year term on the MVP board. Their work on various MVP committees has been recognized in the AGM program, and the aim is to do a more form one more formally to recognize their contribution at a future in-person MVP event. We sincerely thank them for their service on behalf of the industry. At those <clears throat> district meetings, no candidates came forward as potential replacements. MBP is actively searching for replacements for directors in District 4 and District 14. So if you know somebody that might be interested, I ask that you have them reach out to me or a district director that they may 
they may know. So the next step is for the membership to ratify the incoming board of directors for the 2020-2021 or for the upcoming year. Those directors are as follows. Alfred Epp, District 1, and I'll ask if you if you can unmute yourself from or show your video to give a wave. Um, that would be great. So Alfred there. Thank you, Alfred. Nancy Howitt with District 2. She might uh, think she's here. Uh, Andre Stepler, District 3. There's Andre there. Stephen Manns, District 5. Melissa Atchison, District 6. Oh, and there's Stephen there. <laughs> Tyler Fulton, District 7. Matthew Atkinson, District 8. Trevor Sun, District 9. Mike Duguid, District 10. Arvid Notvit, District 11. Mark Good, District 12. And Mary Pazook, District 13. Excellent. Okay. So I'd now like a motion from the floor to ratify your board of directors for 2022-2023 fiscal year. Please either raise your hand, type it in the chat box, and uh, along with your dis district number for the moving and seconding of this motion. I have uh, Lisa, um, sorry, Lisa, who's, you can say your name here and uh, your district if you want to un unmute yourself. Oh, Lisa Sund, District 9. Thank you, Lisa. Can I have a seconder? Dave Kozlowski. District two, I believe. Excellent. So now I will, uh, is moved and seconded to ratify the Manitoba Beef Producers Board of Directors for the upcoming fiscal year 2022-2023. I'll launch the poll now. Those in favor, vote now. Those opposed, vote now. And it looks like the affirmative has it and the motion is adopted. Excellent. So we look forward to this board continuing on, on all the great efforts that we've done over the, the past year. And uh, again, we're actively searching for replacements in district four and 14. So if you know somebody that would be interested in taking part in all our great work, please uh, have them reach out to one of us uh, or me directly in, in, in the office here. So I'd also like to move on and announce the introduction of MVP's executive um, for the 2022-23 fiscal year. They were elected this morning at MVP's board of directors meeting and they are as, as follows. Tyler Fulton, president. Congrats, Tyler. Um, Melissa Atchison, vice president. Matthew Atkinson, second vice president. Mark Good, treasurer. And Mike Duguid, secretary.
The new board and executive will assume its duties at the close of this 43rd annual general meeting this afternoon. Okay, so we are ahead of schedule right now. And because we have the cattle feeders presentation by Casey Vanderplug at not till 310, but also combined with our one resolution debate, um, my recommendation is we make a change to the agenda and do the the VBP resolution now before the health break. Yep, I'm seeing Tyler good with that. And Vera, are you good to move uh, forward with that piece? Yes, I am. Okay, so we're going to begin then the resolution session. As I explained earlier in the meeting, we'll be using the virtual platform to vote when it comes time to vote on the two resolution or the resolutions that we've received. I'll now turn it back over to Vera, who will take the procedures and rules for debate of the resolutions. So take it away, Vera. Thank you, Carson. Uh, one late resolution was received by MVP's um, AGM nomination and resolution committee and is deemed to be in order for debate by the, uh, by, was deemed to be in order for debate by the committee. This is designated as an L.1 verified beef production plus program and Carson has made it available for everyone to see. If that's going to go up on the screen, is it Carson? Okay. Uh, it is the final, it is the final two pages of your program as well, if you have your program in front of you. As Carson has previously explained, voting on the resolutions up for debate is restricted to producers who are members in accordance with the Manitoba Cattle Producers Association, operating as the Manitoba Beef Producers Administration bylaw. What does that mean? Uh, it means that you have requested a refund uh, in the last 12 months. You have not paid all fees to the association as set out by the regulation and are not a member in good standing. So speakers on the motion are limited to two minutes uh, a speech twice. The second speech will be recognized only after everyone wish wishing to speak has spoken once. Please respect your time limit. All remarks are to be uh, directed to the chair, that's myself, and remarks include debate, any amendments, uh, requests for information, a parliamentary inquiry, if you have a question about uh, rules of order, and points of order. Please make your remarks ger germane to the pending question. As earlier, um, at, as with the earlier session on the amendments uh, to the administration bylaw, the vote on this motion shall be conducted a lot electronically. It only requires a majority to adopt. Uh, the resolution is up on the screen. So Vera, would it be helpful if I read the resolution? Because it sure. is a few slides. Okay, why don't you read it? Um, I could read it, but maybe you should read it because you're more familiar with it. Yeah, sure. Yeah, that works Thank good. You. So I'll take it away. So the Verified Beef Production Plus Program resolution reads, whereas a number of Manitoba beef producers participate in Verified Beef Production Plus, a program that enables certified Canadian beef farms and ranches to prove that these operations adhere to the highest standards for food safety, animal care, and environmental stewardship, which is important when it comes to maintaining public confidence in beef production. And whereas in the past cost shared funding was available through successive agriculture policy frameworks to help Manitoba beef producers implement best management practices related to their participation in the VBP plus program or VBP program, just things related to food safety on farm, biosecurity, animal care, BMPs, but this funding is not available to them under the current agriculture partnership, Ag Action Manitoba program. Whereas the priorities outlined in in the November 10th, 2020 Guelph statement for the next policy framework deal with focus areas such as advancing sustainable agriculture and agri-food, building sector capacity, 
the environment and resiliency and public trust, among others. And whereas the aforementioned MP, NPF policy priorities include supporting the agriculture sector to develop, adapt, and enhance assurance systems. And the beef industry believes that government investments in BFP initiatives are beneficial for producers and also helps governments meet their policy objectives related to sustainable agriculture and agri-food production. Be it resolved to recommend that Manitoba beef producers advocate for the reinstatement of cost-shared beneficial management practices related to verified beef production plus program as part of any insurance program that will be offered in the next policy framework from 2023 to 2028. All right, thank you, uh, Carson. Is there a mover and a seconder for this resolution? This wasn't uh, introduced by the board, was it, Carson? No, this was a late resolution, um, and I'm not sure if the, the individual was able to make it, but it looks like, Mike, were you moving? Yeah, Mike, do good, and seconded by Alfred. Okay, thank you. Uh, it is moved and seconded that the Manitoba beef producers, adv MP, MBP, advocate for the reinstatement of cost-shared beneficial management policies related to the Verified Beef Production Plus program as part of any assurance programming that will be offered in the next policy framework, 2023 to 2028. So that is the action um, in motion in, uh, before you. Is there any debate, any discussion? No, I guess it's pretty clear. Oh, so. I see Tyler here. I'm gonna, I think he needs to make, wants to make a comment. Sure. Yeah, I just want to speak in favor of the motion on the table. Um, I think that in the past, when there have been linked benefits, uh, direct benefits uh, in, the, in the way of providing funding for um equipment purchases and so on for beneficial management practices um it has helped uh to um move the industry along in adopting um some of these assurance programs like vbp plus which i think are uh, generally a positive attribute to the uh to the um industry um admittedly i think that there are some um that the program is becoming cost prohibitive, um, but I uh, that is an aside, and uh, I would like to again just support the motion that's put forward. Thank you. Thank you, Tyler. Is there any any other further debate? Any comments? All right, Here, hearing none, uh, we'll uh, have the poll launched again, please, Carson. And though there's the uh, resolution is uh, uh, typed up there. So those in favor, vote now, please. And those opposed, vote now, please. And again, there is that text option. Yes. So we'll just give it another minute to allow those texts to come in, Vera, and then I'll. I'm 
Okay. Well, after seeing some of the texts come in and tallying with the polling vote, 95% um, are in favor, Vera, so. Okay, thank you. Uh, so the affirmative has it and the motion is adopted. Um, that concludes the resolution uh, debate. And I'll now turn the chair back over to Carson. Thank you. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Vera, for, for your assistance on, on that and moving that forward so efficiently. We're uh, well ahead of schedule here. Um, I think because our present presenters coming on are probably going to be joining shortly to that to the time that they have, we might be able to give you some time to step away from the computer here. Um, Tyler, do you have any thoughts here? Or should, and we'll try to get back here around three where I can get uh, uh, Casey on a little early and we'll take a break uh, a little early here. Yeah, absolutely. If you think three o'clock is uh, the earliest that we can kind of reasonably get back to things, then um, that sounds great. I don't see any reason why we can't delay, but I know we need to coordinate with those two speakers. Yeah, so maybe we'll we'll say 2.55 for folks to come back on from your health break, 2.55, and I will uh, work to coordinate with um, with Casey and Dixon. I know Dixon was going to join about a half hour early um, just to you know listen in, um, and I'm sure Casey will be available uh, as well. So let's try with 2.55 back on uh, on the screen. Talk to everyone soon.
Hello again, folks. Getting close to the 255 here. So uh, we'll probably get underway shortly. I see we have our next speaker. Uh, hey, Casey. Oh, Carson. Well, surviving? Whew. You know, we've got issues out there, hey, lots of them. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, I think uh, we'll wait a couple more minutes, Casey, and then you should be have been promoted to co-host. Uh, okay, I don't know how to check yeah. that person, but I'll, I'll yep, I'm, I just checked it. You are co-host, so that should give you the ability to share your screen if you have some slides. Um, okay, I do, and allow yourself to unmute and mute yourself and all that good stuff. So, okay, well, we'll get things set up here. Okay. Yeah, we'll give it another minute or so, Casey, and then I will just pass it right over to you. Okay. I think Casey, Tyler Fulton, our, our chair, our, our president for the years, is debating growing a mustache like yours. Oh, is he? Does, I think okay. he would accomplish it. Tyler, is that is is that going to uh, would that pr provide a boost to your electoral chances? I know that you were you were engaged in that activity for a while, so. <laughs> oh, he can't he can't actually rebuttal because he's uh, <laughs> he's muted. Oh. Oh, that's right. Uh, yeah, Casey, you know I admire it, and it's not. <laughs> It's not a debate for me. I uh, I would do it if my wife wouldn't divorce me for it. For some reason, she's, she's not on board. And let's be honest, uh, that weighs heavily on me. Yeah. So I'm trying to advance these slides, Carson, but I don't seem to be able to. Um... Okay. Um, if all else fails, you can, I don't know how big the file is, but Try clicking on it again. Oh, there we go. Is it moving for you, Carson? Yeah, yeah, it was moving. So okay. you can go back to the start. Yeah, we're, we're good to go. Okay, well, set up. I, yeah, yeah. So I think I see a lot of people coming back in here, Casey. Um, I've already informed them that uh, you're with National Cattle Feeders Association, right? Um, in which we are a member of, and we're very happy right. to have you here to give this this update on behalf of the things you're working on from a national level. So, take it away, Casey. Okay, well, thanks, Carson, and yeah, you know, it's it's a privilege to for me to be here too and to address the AGM for Manitoba beef producers, and we've certainly done that before, and and certainly glad to do it again, and glad to be on the agenda and share with you. You know, some of the accomplishments and results that we've uh, achieved at the National Cattle Feeders on important issues affecting the beef industry, and uh, also our priorities that we're focusing on in the future. And uh, so I'm looking forward to sharing some of that with you this afternoon. I'll, I'll try to get through it in about 15 or 20 minutes. We'll move through it fairly quickly, and then maybe we can have some discussion on these items and issues and and things like that. Now, as you all know, it's been an incredibly tough year, 2021, an incredibly tough year for our industry. And that comes on, on the heels of 2020, which wasn't any easier. Uh, drought, uh, pretty much un unprecedented in, in scope and scale uh, in the country. Uh, floods and fires in BC, we've got major supply chain disruptions in our industry uh, and others as well, affecting inputs that beef farmers need to continue their business. You know, we've got uh, questions of feed availability for feeders and the feeding costs are just absolutely incredible uh, with barley at 450 a metric ton compared to like 250 a few years ago. And that's really hitting on the ability and profitability within the feedlot sector to be sure. And then we've got logistical uh, issues too emerging. Uh, there's a lot of U.S. corn coming into the West right now uh, for feedlot operators, and there's been difficulty in getting that corn. Uh, and it, it's a surge, and I, I think it's essentially a problem with this is a surge of, of need for this uh, 
for this grain commodity and the uh, railways are having difficulty getting it there. And then of course, getting it from the rail to the farm is another issue altogether. And then, you know, also the need to import additional DDGs. Uh, a lot of cattle feeders will, will feed their corn along with some DDGs to increase the protein within the ration, right? And, and that's coming up from the States too, a lot of that out of Minnesota and South Dakota. So, and now we got issues at our borders, right? And that's affecting uh, import of feeder calves uh, from the U.S. and it's 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 affecting dramatically, you know, exports of fed cattle south, right? So this is not an easy time for our industry, and it is not an easy time for cattle feeding either. Uh, and it keeps it's keeping your national organizations busy. It's keeping your provincial organizations busy too. But the 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 amount by which government is now relying on the industry to work together with them and provide them with advice and information, and, and you know on on policy choices that has amped up incredibly, incredibly in the last two years. The the degree to which we're interfacing with our government decision makers on these issues. At the end of the day, you know, it, it feels sometimes like you're almost overwhelmed, right? Um, but it was a good exercise for me to go back through the past year as we developed our report to the provinces, and that's in your annual report. I believe it's published there. Um, and I'll, I'll speak on that a little bit and, uh, and dig into, into some extra details on the things that you'll find in there. So basically, I think this afternoon, just four things. I'm going to talk a little bit about our group, NCFA, who we are, what we do. And uh, <clears throat> I want to talk about our accomplishments last year. And that's an important one for me because in this business, when you're advocating for an industry with government, you, um, the decision's not in your hands. The decision is external. It's a, it's a government decision. And you can only exercise the best of your ability to influence that. Um, and sometimes you're successful and sometimes you're not. But when you are, it's certainly worth recording. I want to talk about our scope of activities in the year and then just a few words on future directions and, and issues we're dealing with. So first, a little bit about us. <clears throat> we're a national group. Our members are provincial beef organizations, Manitoba beef producers, one of them, but also the Saskatchewan Cattlemen's, uh, BC Cattle Feeders, Alberta Cattle Feeders, the Quebec B Beef Federation, and we also receive some, some support from the Saskatchewan Cattle Feeders too, primarily in terms of of individuals to help us out on our files. We have a board that has representation from various provinces uh, across the country. We also have a position there for a representative from the CCA. And that year it's Charlie Christie. Um, but NCFA sits on the CCA board now. CCA has a position on our board now. And we thought that was a good thing to do uh, in order to try to leverage each other's resources a little bit better, avoid any duplication, speak with multiple voices when we can, but work jointly together where we can as well. And we thought that that would be a, a way to facilitate that. Our board chair is James Beckering. He's a cattle feeder in Southern Alberta in the Tabor area. Our vice chair is Will Lowe, and he's a cattle feeder in Saskatchewan. We have staff representatives as well. So every, every provincial member that sends us a board director also sends us what we call a staff rep. And uh, so we have some from Alberta, myself and Jan, of course, uh, Andrea from BC, Christina Carson, of course, from Manitoba and Yannick Sauvé from Quebec. And it's a combination of the board and these staff reps that basically make a lot of, make the decisions on what we're going to be doing. And my hands, hats off to both the directors and the staff, especially this week. We had something like 50 or 60 MP meetings on Tuesday and Wednesday. We did a lobby reach out, a blitz, and uh, broke up into teams. And over a period of two days, we had conversations with between somewhere between 50 and 60 MPs in Ottawa on our issues. And it's one thing we do in the spring, we try to do that in the fall as well. And we just got off of that. It, it's a very tiring and time consuming thing to do, but can certainly pay dividends. And we wanna maintain our relationships with our, with our political champions in Ottawa. We need political champions for our industry in Ottawa. One of the ways we do that is to maintain a regular uh, contact with them, ask them when we need help, and when they need help, we do our best to help them as well and on the files they're working with. I, I think a very important part of our organization are our consultants. 
We've got a team of consultants uh, on the ground in Ottawa working for us. Kathy Jo Noble uh, does a lot of the political tracking for us. She watches what's happening in the Commons, what's happening in the various committees, and she's uh, opening doors for us when we need access. Uh, Cameron Prince uh, is also a consultant in Ottawa. He's a former vice president with the CFIA. And he helps us out on all of our regulatory files and make sure that we can get access to the decision makers within the agency who are basically in charge of the great bulk of regulations on our industry. Megan Madden is out of British Columbia and she manages our communications. And just a, a quick shout out for Peter Brackenridge and John Weeks. They're two consultants. We worked with them for a long time in Ottawa. They both decided to finally retire. My hat's off to them, but they have certainly over the years done great work for us. Our vision is basically uh, we're a business oriented organization and we're dedicated to advancing and strengthening the national fed cattle chain. And our mandate is basically twofold. Uh, we represent cattle feeders on important national in issues that impact their business and impact the sector. And secondly, our mandate is to collaborate or partner with other organizations uh, to strengthen the beef industry. Uh, we will do things on our own, of course, specifically when they're cattle uh, feeder specific issues we're dealing with. But a lot of issues run across the beef value chain. They affect uh, the ranchers, the feeders, the auction marts, processors, right? And when you want to move on those files or something that's very important, it's, I, I think it's critical that you work together. And uh, I know that the, the staff level within these national organizations have a very, very good uh, working relationship. Uh, certainly myself with, with my colleagues at CIA, CCA, my colleagues at the Meat Council, colleagues at the Pork Council. And to the extent that we can do that together, we can work issues together when it makes sense. It's, it's good to do that. Uh, it really, really draws the attention of government decision makers when you see a communication coming in, into the minister and there are 16 or 20 logos on that communication from national agriculture organizations or beef organizations saying, we've got a problem, we need to get this fixed. Uh, we have three strategic pillars in our plan, sustainable growth and profitability, uh, boosting our competitiveness and industry leadership and partnership. I'm gonna quickly skip over that one and get to the heart of what I would like to chat a little bit about with you this afternoon and set our accomplishments in 2021. And there are five that stand out. And uh, I'd, I'd, I'd like to describe these a little bit for you and, and, and the benefits we're getting out of this. Now, the first major accomplishment or result or change we saw in 2021 has to do with ultra high frequency tags. Um, it's been a couple of years we've been working around the potential of UHF tag technology vis-a-vis uh, -vis or compared to uh, the low frequency RFID tags. And uh, in the spring of this year, Canadian Cattlemen's, the Meat Council, National Cattle Feeders Association, all three signed off on a joint statement in support of moving forward with ultra high frequency tag technology. And one of the reasons that this is so important, I think from a regulatory point of view, is we know that enhanced traceability is coming at some time. It's been delayed and delayed, but it's still out there. From our understanding, government's still planning to go with it, with it at some point in the future. Ultra high frequency tags will put industry on a much better uh, footing to um, be able to meet those enhanced traceability requirements simply because they are better able at capturing the data. So that's a significant development. A lot of work still needs to happen on that file. We need an ISO standard. We need CFIA approval for a new approved indicator. Uh, readers out in the field and, and tag manufacturer, all of that needs to come together. We're still very much on the front end of it. Uh, but our initial investigation into the issue shows that there could be substantial benefit to the industry of going this route and in a very cost effective way too. Um, the second thing, and this is something we all know about, is the uh, OAE's uh, BSE negligible risk status for Canada. Um, I, I just want to fill the group in a little bit on, on you know, how this really came about, is that there was a working group of government and industry 
who was pulling together this application to the OIE. And this uh, was a tremendous working group of individuals who really pulled together. It, it, it was members of CCA and NCFA. It was the CFIA folks who were managing the project, but it was also the renderers who were involved in this. Uh, ANAC, the uh, Animal Nutrition Association of Canada and CAHI and other groups all pitched in. And we, we kind of took different parts of this application, right? And, and so NCFA said, we, we will do, map out all the communications and surveillance activities and all that programming that the OIE wants to see. And, and, and that was kind of our part of that application. But there were many hands in that application. It was a solid application. It was strong and it got accepted on the first try. And I think my kudos are off to our government partners and all of the industry partners who participated in that application because this is gonna be a game changer for the Canadian industry to be sure. The third issue is, uh, the third result is this new trusted trader designation. Now, uh, currently, uh, if you're a cattle feeder who's uh, shipping live cattle south of the border, you can use multiple trucks in a, in a convoy load with one export certificate um, to get across the border. The USDA was proposing earlier in the year uh, that convoys be restricted to three trucks per certificate. Now that would be a problem for, for many cattle feedlots who use way more than three trucks to move their cattle south on convoy. And so we engaged with the CFIA, who then engaged with the USDA, and we said, look, you know, if we have trusted traders whose paperwork is always good, where there's never a problem, they're not running afoul of regulations or USDA rules, there's no problem at the processing facilities when they arrive, um, these should be trusted traders, and maybe they should be allowed to exceed that convoy rule, and the USDA agreed to that. So that program was announced on July the 14th and it came into effect in early September. And so exporters of live cattle south who want to be able to do it as expeditiously as quickly can apply uh, to be a trusted trader with the USDA. And, uh, or I, I think it might be with the CFIA, but uh, anyway, make an application for that declaration, that status, and then they can proceed as per usual. And in October, uh, uh, we had new feed regulations published in Canada Gazette One. Uh, these feed regulations were 10 years in the making. And uh, I've been at National Cattle Feeders for almost 10 years now. And if I remember right, one of the very first submissions I made to government was on feed regulations. Uh, CFA did a pretty good job of, of printing out pre-proposals that we could review, provide in, uh, feedback to them on a continual basis on a rolling basis. And when the final regs were published in CG1, and we took a look at them, and I was very, very happily, uh, that's not a surprise, but uh, I was happy to see that a lot of our major issues with that first package had, had been resolved. Uh, and I think what we got here is a fairly modern uh, and workable set of feed regulations that are coming. Uh, there are some challenges with it, and uh, but we've committed with the CFA to work with them uh, on resolving those challenges. And that's primarily on preparing farms who mix medicated feeds on their farm, uh, how to best to prepare a hazard plan and, and a pre preventive control plan. Those are new requirements in the feed regulations. We're, farmers need some assistance with that. Um, and then finally, this is not 2021, it's 2022, but it just happened. Uh, and this is very important for Manitoba and it's around the transport uh, regulations. Uh, the CFIA has restricted that time to 36 hours, as we all know. And ever since this topic really emerged years ago, uh, NCFA has always said to the CFA, we need to keep the four hour flex. Um, if, if, if a driver is on the road, he's within four hours of his destination, why stop? It just makes no sense. So how about the flexibility to continue on, get to destination and unload? And uh, CFA was reluctant on that. And it was not embedded in the regulation, but we had heard uh, in January of this year that uh, guidance going to the inspectors is that uh, they should not treat as a priority um, any transporter who is delivering animals in good condition 
um, where the outcomes are being met and they haven't exceeded 40 hours. So in other words, there's kind of like this four hour window within the enforcement. Um, it's loosey goosey. Um, it's probably not as, as solid as we would like it, but it is there. And we know for cattle moving out of Manitoba, whether they're coming west or whether they're going east, uh, the new 36 hour is a problem, right? Um, where you may you used to be able to go straight through, you can't anymore. We're hopeful that that extra four hours may be enough to, to really avert some difficulties on moving cattle uh, out of Manitoba. So those are some of our, what I would call our, 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 our five largest results. And of course, most things don't happen without a lot of significant effort. And I tend to break our work down here into several buckets, if you will. The first bucket is what I call formal submissions. And this is where uh, our, our staff and our directors are feeding in on specific issues and we're replying to government consultations on everything from free trade agreements to other countries to things like regulatory competitiveness at the CFIA or, or even the development of a new national greenhouse gas carbon offset system at the federal level. Uh, we, we are participating in those consultations where we believe the outcome could uh, impact our members. Uh, we also do a lot of work with parliamentary committees, both at the House uh, and in the Senate. Of course, agriculture committees at the top of the list, but so are things like trade. And so are committees like citizenship and immigration and finance. And so over the course of 2021, we had made a number of written briefs to these committees on Bill C-205, the trespassing on farm bill was a private member's bill and things like food processing capacity, uh, Bill C-216, which would have uh, exempted supply management from any further discussion and future trade agreements and these sorts of things. So we're working a lot of our files through the committee system as well. And then we have what, we, what I call outreach or advocacy. And this stuff is critical. It's time consuming and it, it, it takes a lot of work and effort, but you really need this in order to develop and maintain the relationships with decision makers. And so, as I mentioned, in the spring of fall, we do our MP calls and our outreach. Uh, we, last year, we had a great set of summer tours on feedlot operations in, in Manitoba, British Columbia, and in Alberta the year before Saskatchewan did some. And it's a good opportunity for what we try to do here quite often is get the MPs out of the feedlot, but bring the, that province's MLAs there too. Sometimes they don't have a lot of opportunity to interact the provincial and federal decision makers. We thought at a feedlot tour, it's a good opportunity for them to do that. And we've, we've heard good feedback uh, from members of parliament and MLAs on, on that type of uh, event. Uh, of course, we were engaged in the federal election. We were developing policy priorities already back in April. We developed a list of beef policy priorities and we sent it to every political party. It says, we think you guys are gonna go into an election this fall. You'll need a platform. This is what we would like to see in your ag platform. Um, so engaging in that way. Of course, ongoing communications and letters back and forth and then what I call our top to tops and and every year we like to have a top to top meeting with certain federal agencies and ministers a veterinary drug directorate at Health Canada is one of those of course the CFI president and the VPs and the executive team we try and have a top to top with them as well but then also specific ministers and and various uh, directorates within the CFIA as well and then finally the last bucket and this th this is this is one that the size of this bucket is, has grown a lot in the last two to three years. We're doing a lot more joint advocacy. And I think that's a, a, a good thing. We had joint communications on, on CIPARS funding or surveillance, disease surveillance and pathogen surveillance. Um, the UN Food System Summit did a statement on that, humane transport, uh, mandatory electronic logging devices on, on trucks. Um, all of those issues, we've, we've been engaged jointly on those. We've had joint statements as well coming out on things like business risk management and the priorities for the new Canadian Ag Partnership that uh, will be signed next year. And then even joint products and projects and here I'm thinking and specifically of uh, we signed a contract a number of groups signed a contract with the Southern Alberta Institute of Technology to uh, develop the performance specifications for UHF tags in the beef industry and then finally there's a number of working groups that are there 
and uh, working on specific issues. And we're plugged into that as well. Uh, on the industry side, we have industry working groups on, on carbon and GHG. And this is a big one going forward. Uh, 14 national agriculture groups have joined together under something called the Agriculture Carbon Alliance. And together, we want to be able to interact and affect and influence the government's carbon policy and programming. And uh, this is a relatively new body, but it's quite energized. And uh, we've been doing a lot of work in that area. Uh, things like even running advertisements in, in newspapers down east around the Ottawa and the Hill Times saying, we're here, we're concerned, government needs to listen to agriculture on this file. We talked about UHF tags already. Uh, and then there's the industry government side. We've got working groups there as well. We've got a working group uh, on humane transport. We've got a working group to develop the new Animal Health Canada organization, which is gonna be dedicated to managing animal health and disease mitigation in livestock in the country. Um, and we've got a, a new working group on regulatory reform opportunities that we hope can spill out of this new negligible risk status that we have. And, you know, these, these sorts of mechanisms, I think, uh, are, are, are starting to hold us in much better stead. We're getting in, a, we're getting in at, the, at, at the ground level on some of these very, very important government industry decisions. And the government is seeking our input right at the get-go. And we've encouraged them to continue with that because there's nothing worse than doing a bunch of work and finding out you've entirely missed the mark on things. Um, so it seems to be a, a new operating paradigm that just seems to be growing in importance. So I'll just end with this, some of our future things. And it's basically, this is a slide of just a small portion of my to-do list that's on the desk, but we've got a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, uh, oars in the water on various programming developments. So e-certification and e-shipping manifests and moving more and more to digital technology and getting away from the paper. Uh, there's a whole CFIA uh, initiative called Digital Services Delivery Platform or DSDP. And uh, through that DSDP will be things like e-certification and this, these digital strategies. We need to continue working to roll that out. The Restricted Feeder Program, this is where feeder cattle can be brought in into uh, Canada under specific rules and conditions. Uh, that program is con continually being tweaked and, 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 and adjusted here and there, given new circumstances. We need to stay on top of that. There's some issues emerging with that that we'll need to address this year. Of course, business risk management programming going forward, that's a big one. Um, climate action as well. On the regulatory side, we've got the new feed regulations that are coming in. And, and I think we're going to be working quite closely with the CFIA on developing good guidance documents for on-farm with model systems and examples and, and make it very clear and, and very interactive, easy to access. Because we think that's probably where the, most of the difficulty in rollout is going to be is simply making sure that everyone who's under the regulation has the capability to comply. And that means that government's gonna to have to make some investments in that. And we're willing to, of course, help them with that, not on the investment side, but certainly developing the material. Uh, there are rumblings in the EU about new uh, veterinary medicine agents, uh, vet veterinary product regulations coming from the veterinary medicine agency. Um, so we're keeping close eye on that. We're working very closely with the Market Access Secretariat uh, on that issue. Um, and then there's a whole range of other issues, you know, our supply chain disruptions. We've got rural infrastructure deficits that we need to re resolve, ongoing labor shortages, you know, competitiveness of the industry and, and uh, trade. And, and a big one emerging too is, is trade and maximizing the benefits of our FTAs, right? Um, government signed a lot of free trade agreements in the last decade. And, you know, it might, we've been suggesting the government, you know, you might want to do a whole scale study to find out, you know, to what extent these are benefiting Canadians and where are we not maximizing our opportunities, where are the benefits not coming from and how do we make these agreements work better for the Canadian economy. And on top of this all, our chair uh, is now the chair of the uh, Canadian Beef Advisors for 2022. And this is the group that manages the national beef strategy. 
Um, and this is a set of, of course, goals and objectives for the entire beef supply chain to achieve. And uh, that chair rotates every year. NCFA, NCFA is chairing that again in 2022. And I would just say on this one, there is a certain thing in that strategy that we're, we're working towards. And that is that goal of reducing our GHG footprint, or carbon footprint by 33% by a certain time down the road, right? And so that's going to continue to be there and, and uh, uh, you know, present issues that we need to work on and resolve. So that's just a very quick, rapid overview. I know it's machine gun fire. I apologize for it. It comes at you very quickly, but I'm not going anywhere for the next little while. I'm happy to stick around and talk about any of these things or whatever might be on your mind. So thanks a lot, Carson. Thanks for your attention, everybody. And uh, yeah, I'll pass it back to you, Carson. Wonderful. Well, thanks, Casey. I think you can probably stop sharing your screen. Um, and then we will. Uh, there we go. Yeah. So uh, I'd like to give uh, Audrey a chance to make any comments she'd like. Um, as she is our representative on a national cattle feeders uh, board, uh, our Manitoba rep. So Audrey, you should be able to unmute yourself because I removed that. Uh, that. So yep, looks like you're good to go. You, you can hear me. You're good, Audrey. Ter terrific. terrific. You know what, because um, Larry's also listening to this meeting, I have to just turn down his speaker because there's a little bit of, uh, oh, can you just give me one moment? Yeah, I could hear a bit of a echo still. Perfect. Forget me for that. Can you hear me now? Yeah, we're good. Okay, great. We, we're both trying to multitask here today. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity. Um, thank you so much for that, Casey. Very, very thorough representation of what National Cattle Feeders does. And I'm privileged to be able to uh, represent Manitoba on this board. Uh, like Casey said, the last couple of days, we worked pretty tirelessly on a number of MP meetings, which were very uh, insightful hard work because each of them have different portfolios and different levels of interest. So the questions are always different. So it's great to be able to tackle that as a team. Um, and of course, you know, I very much wear a Manitoba hat. So I, I have a much more understanding sometimes of what happens to us here provincially as opposed to all of that national understanding. But when you have talent like this on the board, uh, you feel very, very confident because they fill in all the blanks. And I'm sure you just got a sense now of what Casey highlighted and Manitoba beef producers knows this well. Um, many years ago, of course, as you know, I, I worked with Manitoba beef producers too. And one of the first things I learned was the amount of work that all of you as individuals do is absolutely insurmountable. I don't know if anybody really can get a full comprehension of it because all of these programs, all of this extra work, this communication, it's very, very intensive and it takes a lot of commitment. So um, I want to thank uh, you very much, uh, Carson, and your team for everything that you do. I know some members of the board uh, personally. I see Melissa there. Melissa, I am probably Probably one of her number one fans. So, uh, uh, you know, always grateful to hear from uh, She's full of wisdom and, and knowledge. Uh, Casey is absolutely second to none. Um, we, one of the things, if I can circle back, and it's, it's a little inappropriate to go back to a previous topic, but I just wanted to say uh, the reason why I would also be in, in support of directors keeping on longer roles is when we build relationships with a lot of these organizations, consistency really does matter. There, there is such a learning curve to all of these issues and moving these things forward on behalf of our producers that the consistency really, really makes a difference uh, in relationship building, but also this vast knowledge of understanding that's required to move these things forward. So, so having Casey there for the amount of time that we've had, uh, Janice is our new president, is, uh, she's, she's newer, but she's really proven to be um, worthwhile in that position. The, the rest of the board um, there. And then of course, yeah, the consistency that we have on the Hill with our lobbyists. My only assurance at the high level is to say um, the feeding industry, I believe is represented very well. And I love that you highlighted as one of our wins, uh, Casey, the fact that we're doing a little bit more cross um, uh, communication with some other industries. And in, in fact, if we did receive any input last uh, yesterday, even from, you know, uh, an MP like Dan Mazur, who actually understands the lobby side of things, it's very actually effective for them as well when we when we come together more, when we find these kind of commonalities in, in our in our industry issues and, and bring that forward, I think we have a greater chance of, uh, of moving these things into a positive direction for our producers. So 
Um, I, he, I can't say more specifically. Uh, I said yesterday a number of times, I think it's our favorite topic in the world, so we can talk endlessly about, about this, right? But thanks for just the opportunity for me to say hello here. Um, and thank you, Casey, very much for the amazing, um, incredible, committed work that you're doing. Um, and I'm always available here in Manitoba as well. I think I missed the opportunity to speak at the last a board meeting, but now after I heard Casey, I would say we should probably just defer to Casey in the future. But uh, anyway, I, I'm happy to be here and thank you very much for the opportunity to introduce myself. Well, don't undersell yourself, Audrey. Um, you're able to explain all the issues and all the efforts that cattle feeders are going through, especially after seeing you through the, uh, the lobby week this week, your technical first fly-in, but you have lots of experience talking with MPs and MLAs to begin with. So thank you for all that. Thank you. <clears throat> when I look at the calendar here, we don't have much more time before our keynote speaker, um, but I will open it up for maybe one comment or question if anybody has anything for Casey or Audrey. And again, thank you so much for coming on and giving that great update. Lots, lots going on. Well, if my presentation answered everyone's questions, I would just leave everyone with this. Uh, the National Cattle, on, on behalf of the National Cattle Feeders, our, our board and our staff, we appreciate and we value MBP's membership in the organization. Uh, we run a lean ship, we're highly focused, and uh, we work our best to produce results that are going to improve our industry. And so that's what drives us day in, day out. But we appreciate uh, your membership. We appreci appreciate your participation, both in terms of the director you've appointed and Carson, uh, your, your general manager too. So thank you very much. Look, and uh, with the snow that we've got sitting on the ground now, um, I'm, I'm definitely choosing to, to, uh, to look on the bright side here and, and hope that we've turned a corner here. Um, so just a, a couple of notes uh, from, I think, lessons really that I would call from 2021 um, that, I, that I just jotted down. Um, first off, I, I noticed that, I, uh, that with all these virtual meetings, I get like super jittery and, uh, and I, you know, I just, you know, I get tense and, you know, I start wanting to pace and stuff. And then one, one of the meetings about a month and a half ago, I, I ran out of coffee and I didn't, I had one cup of coffee in the morning and I figured out that that was the reason why I was getting so jittery. I'm used to working outside, right? And, and just not, you know, not having those multiple couples, cups of coffee. So um, that was, that was lesson number one in these, uh, in these uh, virtual meeting times. Uh, number two uh, for, for this year, um, advocacy uh, that we do here uh is hard work and it's tiring and i say it's hard work and i've always kind of just discarded honestly when you know when you hear politicians or 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 people talk about hard work it's just hard to relate that to you know the farm um but but it is and it's it's time consuming and it's um exhausting um but it's important and so therefore, it's also rewarding when you're uh, successful at it. And I really think that uh, the staff and the directors over the course of the last year have really pulled together. And uh, I'm really proud of, of what we were able to do in the context of the, of the drought. Um, so that's, uh, that's lesson number two. Number three, comic relief is just critical. Uh, I love that uh, presentation from, from Quick Dick McDick, uh, big fan of his, just super authentic guy, right? And uh, and so I I uh, I wanted to pass on the fact that I want to thank Mel and Melissa here for uh, for being our comic relief. Uh, more often than not, she's providing that uh, and and bringing a little perspective to the to the situation that we're debating. Uh, so thank you, Melissa. And uh, I guess lastly, uh, I just think it's worth mentioning that, uh, I don't know if this is gonna come out quite right, but um, I think credibility in this, you know, in the context of advocacy is, is really matters. Um, I, I think that, 
you know, we put in a ton of work um, and we engaged thoughtfully on, on these drought consultations with the province and with the federal government and, you know, and other organizations, uh, ag organizations as well. And, and I think what it did was it provided this track record of trust and, and, and the, the willingness to kind of consider all options and debate, you know, thoughtfully. And, and when you have this track record of that, then people will go to you um, without really being concerned about, uh, about being hung out to dry. Um, and so uh, I just kind of thought that that was worth mentioning in this, uh, in this. And, and it came to me when I, after Casey's uh, presentation here, um, because he was talking about this unprecedented engagement from, from government and a new paradigm. And I really felt, I mean, I don't have a lot of history at this, but it, it definitely struck me that, uh, that we were super engaged uh, for, for quite a long stretch. And I think that's a positive thing uh, that we can, you know, that we can um, be able to be a greater influence at an earlier stage. Uh, and I, I think that's, that's what counts. So those are my, my lessons from 2021. Um, thank you uh, to the committee, to the staff that, that puts in so much effort on, onto the AGM here, uh, our speakers and all the participants, whether you be uh, cattle guys or cattle farmers or, or ranchers or uh, or, you know, other ag organizations or, or government types. Um, thanks all for, for being uh, engaged here. It's, uh, it's good stuff. I really appreciate it. Anyways, with that, I think I'll call the, the meeting. Oh, one quick comment. Go ahead, Carson. Yep. <clears throat> one thing we forgot to do was announce the winner of the pre-registration or the early bird registration for the Quick Dick McDick kind of prize package merchandise package and through a random draw of 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 those folks uh jill verway uh is the is the winner so jill i think you're still on there uh i see verway farms so if if you are i'll just ask you if, uh, flip me a note at the office uh, you should have or brenna from cap should have my mess should have my email and um we'll get you get you ordered up uh for that for that package so that's awesome. Congratulations. Okay, so with that, I, I don't think there's any other business to attend to. Um, thanks all for attending, and we'll um, go ahead and adjourn. Bye, everybody. <laughs>